Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to UX Bristol 2020. I'm so glad that um, so many of you have managed to join us virtually. Um, my name is Stuart Church. I'm here with my co-organizers, James Chudley and Dave Ellender. Um, yeah, well, as you can imagine, this isn't quite how we anticipated UX Bristol turning out this year. Um, it's our 10th birthday. Um, if you go to the next slide, please, Kirsty. Um, here are some pictures of UX Bristol from years gone by when we were kind of younger and crazier. We were hoping to put on quite a, a, a big um, real event at the M Shed where we normally hold it in Bristol. Um, thanks to a global pandemic, it's now being held virtually. Um, but out of that, I think a lot of positives have come, to be honest. We've uh, enjoyed the challenge of adapting to having an online event. Um, and rather than run the conference on a single day, we spread it out over three. Um, and we've already had a couple of days of, of absolutely fantastic workshops. Um, one of the other benefits we have is that we now have a much bigger and international audience. Um, so as well as some familiar faces who we know are, are, are watching, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to welcome a few of you from further ashore. I know I've got people from as far afield as, as Canada and Brazil and India watching. So, so thank you very much for, for tuning in. Um, if you don't know Bristol at all, um, it's a very friendly and diverse city in the southwest of England. Um, most famous for um, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and we've got a great suspension bridge. Ardman Animations, who make Wallace and Gromit, are based here, and it's the hometown of, of Banksy. Um, and it made global news more recently when um, a statue of a slave trader, Edward Colston, was torn down and um, uh, unceremoniously dumped into the river here. So Bristol's definitely a city with its heart in the, in the right place. Um, so on that note, one of the things that we've always prided ourselves in with UX Bristol is um, putting on a very friendly, diverse and supportive um, style of conference. And we've been sort of fairly informal as well as we've gone along. This, this is obviously going to be a little bit harder to, to kind of replicate when we're scattered all over the world. If you just skip to the next slide, please, Kirsty. Um, so we do actually have a, a code of contact. So. Um, Obviously, you've got a YouTube stream, and there'll be an opportunity for people to, to, to comment and ask questions, and we'll put questions to the, the presenters at, at, at the end of their talks. But we do ask you that really just to be kind of positive and encouraging and respectful of, of people with, within the, the chat. And when, you know, we don't really uh, tolerate any form of uh, harassment or, or abuse. So, um, yeah, let's make it, make it fun for everyone, please. And above all, I just hope you really um, enjoy um, the morning. So I'd just like to hand over to James now for a word about our sponsors. Thanks, Stu. And Kirsty, would you mind just flipping us to sponsors? Fantastic. Thanks very much. So, yes, uh, as, as Stu mentioned, it's a slight change of format this year, and there's absolutely no way we could have done any of this without support from our wonderful sponsors. And actually, all three of our sponsors here, most of Mensa, Ovo Energy and Adlib, have supported us over over the years and have been absolutely fantastic uh, supporters of the event so thank you so much um, to all of them for, for helping us out uh, we really wouldn't have been able to do this without you there was a one one um, particular note here that uh, sam from uh, mason mentor mentioned they've got a new newsletter all about problems worth solving so do check out their website on mason mentor to find out a bit more about that um, thank you to ovo again for your uh, continued support and thanks so much for helping to subsidise some additional tickets for attendees to this year's conference. That was incredibly generous and a great thing to do. And also thanks so much to Adlib for your continued support and also for the um, series of blogs that you've run over the years to help promote uh, both the speakers and their talks. So thanks so much to all of our sponsors. Kirsty, would you mind just... Okay, so um, you can't have a Zoom call these days without having a mirror board. I think we're all aware of that. Hopefully that's not you know the zoom calls and all the, you know making your uh, computers churn too much but we've uh, we've created a mirror board and um, for those of you who signed up through the meetup you should have received an email i believe last night or this morning with a link to um the mirror board which we're calling more of a smorgasbord because it's a buffet of uh, of delights um normally when we're in the m shed in bristol uh, we have all sorts of things going on we have a jobs board we have a board where you can sign up if you want to be a mentor or if you're a mentee if that's a word uh, looking for a mentor and all sorts of things like that. So we thought, well, how can we kind of try and recreate a little bit of the essence of the M Shed where we normally hang out this time every year? And, and you can do all of those things within this mirror board. We've got um, loads of photos as well that I've dug out from the archives. So that will give you a sense of what, what the event's like. Um, in addition to the mentoring and jobs, um, the mentoring board, we've also got a jobs board. So if you're looking for a job, 
uh, please let us know on the board. Also, if you're advertising uh, vacant positions, please let us know on there as well. So that's been a great way in the past for people to pick up jobs, I'm sure, over the years, over the 10 years we've, we've been running this. Um, lots of people have ended up with, with new careers um, from your expressor, which, which is a brilliant thing. Um, the other thing we'd love you to do on the Miro board is to introduce yourselves so we know who you are and what you do all day. That'd be great. Um, we've also got a world map and we thought it'd be great if you can tell us where you are on the world, that'd be, in, within the world. That'd be absolutely brilliant. Um, so there's all sorts on there. Do, do take time whenever you like just to just have a browse around and explore the board. Okay, Dave, I think over to you to talk, talk about the shop. Uh, next slide, please, Kirsty. Thank you. So morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave. Um, yeah, this year we've got merchandise, everyone. We did do t-shirts a few years ago, which were really popular. And um, mine's pretty much almost worn out now. But um, yeah, now we have a classic t-shirt in a variety of colours and uh, stickers, which I think are going to be um, definitely the ones I, I, I want, I think, on the laptop straight there yeah but mugs as well and travel mugs as well once, once we all get back to traveling a bit more yeah so um do check those out i think there's a shop on red bubble so perhaps we can um get the link sent around for that um but it's yeah, linked from the miro board as well dave so oh great cool yeah. thank you Stuart. um yeah but uh, of course we're not really here to um be pushing products on you you know these are just here here um if you want them. What we're here for is, is the short talk. So if, if we could get the short talks up, Kirsty, that'd be great. Thank you. So yes. Um, so today is actually the third day of UX Bristol this year. Normally it's just a one day event, but um, we've had a couple of days of, of workshops yesterday and the day before um, with Jesmond, Errol, uh, Effie um, and Steve. Uh, perhaps some of you came to, to some of those workshops, really, really, um, really good, good workshops that we've had. But today is the short talks and we're really happy to, to put on five speakers for you today. And we're going to kick off with Sam, who's going to talk about storytelling, which I'm really looking forward to. I particularly uh, think stories are the way we understand the world. So if, uh, if we know a little bit about how we... Um, uh, tell stories and understand stories, then we can understand a lot of how people experience the world. So really looking forward to that one. Uh, a bit later, we've got Candy, and Candy uh, is a content designer. And of course, what she's interested in is do people understand the content that, uh, that they're reading? 10.45, we've got Rita, who is talking about service design. Um, I think that probably speaks for itself, but um, uh, then 11.15, Joe Knowles has a talk called The Stoic Designer. And um, yeah, I think we've probably all experienced that thing where, where designs um, don't quite come out how we, how we perhaps want them to, and what do we do about that? So um, yeah, interested in that one with Joe. And then very last up is John, who's, who's dialed in from uh, America and, uh, He's talking about creating a design integrated business to, to build digital products that win and six best practices to get you there. So, um, yeah, that's going to pack a, pack a bit of a punch, I think. So, um, yeah, so that's what we've got for you today. So looking forward to this. So um, I think it's with great pleasure that I'm going to um, introduce Sam now. So um, let me just uh, <clears throat> bring this up on screen. But um, yeah, so Sam uh, has worked in the civil service since 2015 in a variety of departments and digital roles. She's currently head of digital at the Cabinet Officers National Leadership Centre and has previously worked in local digital collaboration unit at the Ministry of Housing. So, um, yeah, that's quite, quite, uh, quite a place for you to work there, Sam, yeah. So... Um, Housing communities and local government. Sorry, I'm misreading that. Yeah, so she's previously worked at the local digital collaboration unit at the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. God, what do they call these ministries these days? Uh, and 
really what that's about is helping councils around the country to improve their dig digital services for the public through the provision of the local digital fund. And that's, she's acting as a consulting product manager there. So yes, without much further ado, I will hand you over to Sam. Hello. Um, thank you everyone for the introduction and um, thank you for having me today. Uh, it's a bit daunting. I can't see anyone's faces so I don't know uh, if I'm making sense and things like that. So please um, make the organisers aware if you want me to reiterate a point or to explain something further but there will be time for questions at the end. Um, so yeah like um, I was introduced, I'm Sam, I work in um, the civil service. I've been in the civil service for five years now. Um, before that, I worked in marketing and advertising and bits and pieces like that. Um, so as you can imagine, moving into the civil service has been a bit of a culture change, um, which is one of the reasons why I've started thinking a lot about storytelling. Uh, because it, within the civil service, obviously, we work for the government and we deliver services for the public, but we are also um, policy and general professionals who uh, gather evidence and make it available to ministers so that they can make decisions about policy. Um, within that, that means that we're quite constrained in what we can do because there's lots of governance around us and rightly because we're spending public money and we need to make sure that the decisions around spending that public money are the right ones. So part of what I do working in digital is to make sure that um, we're not just delivering great digital products, but we're also making sure that we're um, getting value for money and we're doing the right things. So there's lots of um, there's lots of bureaucracy, there's lots of report writing, there's lots of governance structures. And what I found coming from an advertising and marketing background is that within government, we have all of these structures, but they are so rigid and they're so based on giving people assurances that we're doing the right thing that they don't actually hold the power within them to um, uh, to spread out and to inspire other people and to pass on knowledge so that they can learn from what you're doing and learn from your mistakes. So while I've been working in government, I've started um, writing a lot more on Medium and sharing blogs and things like that because it feels important to not just do the governance side of things and have the information shared over here in an inaccessible way, but also to um, spread the message. So I started thinking about how we use stories to do that. And um, in January, I delivered a workshop at uh, UK Gov Camp, which was popular. Um, and was about how we tell stories using a children's book. So I've got my children's book here. And we're going to do some reading this morning using the tiger who came to tea. Now, I know that there are some people um, from around the world here today. You might not know the tiger who came to tea. I think it's fairly well known in England and Canada. Um, but elsewhere, you might not have heard of it. But hopefully that shouldn't um, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. So we're going to talk about the most simple way of telling stories and how they apply to the kinds of projects that you might be working on as a digital UX professional uh, in whatever business. Um, so we're going to be talking and I've gone really lo-fi this morning. I've got no slides for you or anything. I've got some post-it notes. So I'm going to hold up my post-it notes and hope that you can see them, but I will also talk them through. So hopefully that's accessible to people. We're going to be talking about this, which is the narrative arc. So this is one of the most simple storytelling techniques there is out there. And basically, the narrative arc is a story generally of a big life change. So generally, you'll have uh, a narrative arc used where you're telling a really big story of something like, if you think of Harry Potter, something massive happens in someone's life. And this is the sort of trajectory that that story takes. So what we're going to do is we're going to read the tiger who came to tea. We're going to talk about the narrative arc. And we're going to talk also about how that might apply to your projects or your work. Um, so Friday morning, I'm going to read you a story. I am a mum, so I'm going to do my best mum voice for you. So the narrative arc starts with this bit down here which is called the exposition. So the exposition describes the world 
before an event happens. So going back to Harry Potter, um, the world before anything happens is Harry living under the stairs and you get a sense of Harry's world and the people who are in his world and what he li- where he lives. So when we read The Tiger Who Came to Tea, we're going to have a think about that exposition. Ugh. Once there was a little girl called Sophie and she was having tea with her mummy in the kitchen and suddenly there was a ring at the door. And Sophie's mummy said, I wonder who that can be. It can't be the milkman because he came this morning. And it can't be the boy from the grocer because this isn't the day he comes. And it can't be daddy because he's got his key. We better open the door and see. So in our exposition, we've got a sense of what the world was like before the story takes place. And if you're working in Agile and Digital, like there will always be a status quo that you're moving from. There will be a way of working or a way of doing things. And your story needs to describe the before so that people understand what's going to change. The next part of the narrative arc is the exciting bit. It's called the inciting incidents. So the inciting incident is when something happens that um, means that the characters in it need to change and need to do something. So in the case of the tiger who came to tea, the inciting incident is this. Sophie opened the door and there was a big, furry, stripy tiger. And the tiger said, excuse me, but I'm very hungry. Do you think I could have tea with you? And Sophie's mummy said, of course, come in. So the inciting incident compels the hero, which is us in the story, to an action that leads to change. So the inciting incident in the tiger who came to tea is a tiger turning up at the door. The inciting incident in Harry Potter might be Hagrid turning up to tell him he's a wizard. Either way, what we've done so far is we've explained the world as it was, and then we've explained something that's meant that things have to change. So if you work in UX, you might find that you're working on a website and you discover that loads of people are dropping off at one page, and you want to change that. If you're working in government or in local government, you might find that someone's written a report that tells you you must do better and then you need to do something to change it. So you've got the world as it was before and then an action that compels you to change. So after inviting, inexplicably inviting a tiger into tea, because I mean, of course, come in. Sophie's mummy said, would you like a sandwich? But the tiger didn't just take one sandwich. He took all of the sandwiches on the plate and swallowed them in one big mouthful. Oh, and he still looked hungry. So Sophie passed him the buns. But again, the tiger didn't just eat one bun. He ate all the buns on the dish and he ate all of the biscuits and all of the cake until there was nothing left to eat on the table. And Sophie's mummy said, Would you like a drink? And the tiger drank all of the milk in the milk jug and all of the tea in the teapot. So after our inciting incident, we know that something has to change in the world. And what we have in the narrative arc is this section here, which is called the rising action. And the rising action essentially is where something leads to something, leads to something, leads to something. It's when the forces of change begin their work. And actually, if you think about it in terms of the tiger who came to tea, he has some sandwiches, has some buns, he has some tea, has some milk. And then, as we'll see, he goes on to eat all of the rest of the food in the house. When we work in Agile, we work in sprints. And the purpose of our sprints is to learn something in a set period of time that affects what we're going to do in the next sprint. So essentially, we're learning we're synthesizing, we're moving on. And that is very similar to our rising action. It explains the journey that we're going on and explains why we've taken the decisions that we've taken. So when we're using the narrative arc, that rising action is very similar to our sprint process. Now, the tiger eats a lot of stuff. So I'm gonna jump over 
all the stuff he eats because it's quite a lot. But by the end, the tiger has drunk all the milk and all the orange juice and all of daddy's beer. And I'm not sure why it's daddy's beer, should be everyone's beer. And all of the water in the tap. Oh, there he is, drinking all the water in the tap. And then, because he's a cheap, cheeky tiger, oh, just want to check you can see me because my computer did something. OK, because he's a cheeky tiger, he eats all the food in the house. And then he says, thank you for my nice tea. I think I better go now. And he went. So he eats all of the food and then sods off. And Sophie's mummy said, I don't know what to do. I've got nothing for daddy's supper. The tiger has eaten it all. I'm not sure why mummy needs to be responsible for the supper. However, what we see here is a crisis. So all this action, all these decisions and all of the rising action that we've just been through takes us to a place where suddenly we find that we don't know what to do. And I have definitely, definitely been in projects where that's been the case. So we might find that we are working on an alpha, which we decide is not fit for purpose and that we need to throw it away. We might uh, decide that the hypothesis that we're working to doesn't make any sense anymore. We need to go back to the drawing board. Or, as often happens in government, we might find that we get blocked by something. Either the money might run out or we might meet a senior who doesn't agree with our way of working or who doesn't understand it. We might meet a crisis point where we don't know what to do, just like Sophie's mummy. She doesn't know what to do about dinner. So, Sophie also found that she couldn't have a bath because the tiger had drunk all the water in the tap. Now, they did a, a cartoon of Tiger Who Came to Tea on TV at Christmas and ahead of it, one of the water companies in the UK said, don't worry, it's not possible to drink all the water out of the tap. So just rest assured you're not going to run out of water if a tiger comes around. If You've probably got bigger problems if a tiger does come around. So Sophie's daddy then came home. And Sophie and her mummy told him what had happened and how the tiger had eaten all the food and drank all the drink. Now, when we have a crisis in a project, we don't just curl up and and hide, and we don't run away from that crisis, mostly because we have to go to work and we have to earn our money. <laughs> um, but there is something that does happen, which is often the hero will push back against those problems. The hero will work out a way to overcome that crisis. Now, I think this is a really salient point in the time he came to tea. This is where it gets really deep, guys. So bear with me. The way that Sophie and her mummy push back on that issue is uh, by having a conversation with daddy. Like, I really like how the crisis is overcome with a really simple conversation and an explanation of what's happened. And I think we could all learn something from that. So... Sophie's daddy, because Sophie's daddy is the only one in this family who can drink beer and have ideas, says, I know what we'll do. I've got a very good idea. We'll put on our coats and we'll go to a cafe. So they went out in the dark and all the street lights were lit and all the cars had their lights on and they walked down the road to a cafe. Now we've had our crisis. And we've had our pushback. So now this is the climax part of the story. So the climax bit is where the opposing forces duel and there is a clear winner and a loser. So in this example, Sophie and her mummy have pushed back against the forces of having no food. And they've won because they've gone out for sausages and chips and ice cream with their daddy. So that to me, like sausages, chips and ice cream is a win any day of the week. But our climax in this story has a clear winner. Sophie and her mummy go out for dinner. I think that's a win. So in the narrative arc, we've gone all the way from the world before the tiger turned up. The rising action, which is all the stuff the tiger ate while he was there. 
we've hit a crisis where we didn't know what to do and we've overcome that crisis and someone's won and they've all had sausages and chips and ice cream. Now, what happens next is one of the most important parts of this, which I think is often overlooked when we're telling stories. And I always spell it wrong because it's French and I'm not very good at French, but it's the denouement. So as we described the world before the tiger turned up, it's really important that we, dis we describe the world after all of the events have taken place. And in a narrative arc, we return to a world that has changed like massively. So the world that we saw at the beginning is so far away from the world that we see now. So the denouement is describing the world that we're currently in after we've made the change. And so in the story, in the morning, Sophie and her mummy went shopping and they bought lots more things to eat. And they also bought a very big tin of tiger food in case the tiger should come to tea again. But he never did. So in our denouement, we've got a hark back to the beginning where there was a world of possibility where a tiger could turn up for tea and that would all be inexplicably cool. And now we've got a world where the tiger has come to tea, but he's never going to come back. And the world has changed forever for Sophie and her mommy. The world is completely different to when we started just a few pages ago. And it's really important that when we're telling the story, we explain that to Newmont so that we give people the difference and the opposites between the start and the end. That is the tiger who came to tea. I have finished the book. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to, one of the reasons I chose the tiger who came to tea to do this kind of activity is because it's so simple and the narrative arc is really simple to remember. If you Google narrative arc, you will see hundreds of pictures um, of this that you can use in presentations and uh, to have conversations with your teams. The other reason is because when we're in school, they teach us this. And when we're three, four or five years old, they teach us how to write stories with a start and a middle and an end, which is exactly what I've just told you. But something happens in our school life along the way where we start to believe that actually you have to have some kind of inane talent to be able to do things. So you have to have some talent as a sportsman or an artist or a writer. It's not true. Um, all of those things people get good at because they practice. And I believe that storytelling is a practice. And I believe that you can take these very, very simple structures and you can use them uh, to start spreading knowledge about your work and knowledge about what you're doing. Also, one of the things I wanted to raise as well is I chose this book because it has Sophie, a child as the main character. And I think having a child as the main character and having something so random as a tiger turn up tells us something really important about stories too, which is that when we're children, these stories tell us how to navigate the world. They help explain the world to us. And they're magical. At the beginning of this story, there's a world of possibilities. There are all sorts of ways that it could go. Like the tiger doesn't eat them all, thankfully. But there are so many things that could happen during the course of this story. And one of the things that gets lost when we're working is the ability to inspire and the ability to take some of this magic and pass it on to other people so that they can learn, so that they can remember things and so that their work can be better. And we're not good at that. Um, I've been in show and tells or meetings where everyone's just falling asleep because that magic isn't there. So what I would encourage you to do is one, if you take anything away from this, one, remember, this is a practice and it's easy. Children do it. The second thing is, if you can find that magic thing within your story, that's going to be what passes the story on to lots of other people and make sure they know what you're doing. Um, and that's 15 minutes. Whistle stop tour. As a tiger, he came to tea, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, 
If there are any questions or if anyone wants to know anything more, then please drop them into the chat or into the comments and I'll be able to answer them for you. Thank you, Sam. Hopefully you can hear me. That was absolutely fantastic. That was, uh, that was brilliant. It was really nice to be read a book this time in the morning. <laughs> I'm the one reading the book to my kids in the evening, and that's a that's a, a favourite of mine as well. Um, I don't think we've had any questions yet, but um, as they get fed over, I've got a few for you. But as they come over from YouTube, I'll uh, I'll read them from the chat. But um, I had a, a few questions for you myself, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, do you have any? Um, I love that idea of finding the magic in the story, um, and sort of that becoming the thing that gets retold and retold and retold, and sometimes interesting and fun to see how that gets changed. Whatever, and then it comes back to you. Um, have you got any tips for how you, how do you decide what the magic is that you decide to share? Is it obvious or do you think about that? I don't think it always is obvious. Um, and I think it's going to differ massively depending on what your uh, project is. But there's always a kind of, especially when you're doing user research or if you're doing user testing, as I'm sure loads of the people on this um, call will be, there's always what I call an aha moment where you think you know what that person is going to say that you're testing with or you're talking to. And then they say something completely like that completely blows your your hypothesis out of the water. And you say, oh, you do it like that. Right. And it's those kinds of like spark moments where you have the opportunity to really grasp onto something that tells a story in a much more um, interesting way. Um, and so I would look out for those kind of aha moments in testing. Um, because that might just be it. Okay, and then do you, do you sort of deliberately construct um, things that allow you to share these stories? Like obviously this is something that you're passionate about and something you know a lot about. Um, do you then construct things like show and tells as a, as a way to uh, allow you to share these stories or like what are your tactics? How do you spread those aha moments? How do you do that? So I think, like I said at the beginning, I'm coming from a government context and the government, or the civil service in the UK employs 450,000 people, I think, um, which is on one hand really daunting and on the other hand really like amazing because you've got so many people out there with so much knowledge. And it's actually really freeing because um, I think a lot of us when we come into roles, we start to think that we should be the expert in everything and we beat ourselves up about the fact that we don't know everything. From my perspective, working in government in particular, I know that it's impossible for me to know everything and I'm actually quite freed by that. So I think um, one of the reasons why I think storytelling is so important is because it helps you to make those connections. And you mentioned earlier, sometimes you'll tell a story, it will get shifted and sort of slightly mutated into something else. The key thing for me is that telling the story forms a connection with someone and in government especially, Telling those stories has enabled me to um, find like minded people or to find someone who might know the answer to something if I don't. So it's enabled me to build those connections that mean I have a wider network, which mean I have a greater body of knowledge that I can draw on. Um, I think in terms of how you run show and tells, I did a, a session at Service Design in Gov in um, March this year. And that um, I took a few other people with me and we talked about how we can use this narrative arc for show and tells for service assessments. So in um, government, whenever a service reaches a key milestone, we assess it to make sure that it's um, fit for purpose. Um, and also in job interviews, we talked about how we can use each of these things and apply it to, um, to those three areas. So I think um, it's less about how you necessarily prepare for your show and tells or your ceremonies or this and that and the other. It's more about how you conceive of the information you want to get across and, and how you kind of think about your audience and what you want to say to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I'm interested just to um, find out a bit more about, you mentioned about job interviews. What, what, what do you mean in that context? Is that about when you're being interviewed just to tell lots of stories? Yeah. Yeah, so in government, we, um, and I'm sure other people have heard of this too, you're told that when you go into a job interview, you should use this thing called the STAR method to tell your uh, story, of um, to answer a question. So we basically get, um, in government, very formulated questions. Tell us about a time when 
X, 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 you did this. And when someone says, tell us about a time, they're essentially to asking you to tell a story. <laughs> That's almost like once upon a time you could start it with. So this uh, narrative arc method actually relates really well to the STAR method. So STAR is situation, task, activity, results, it's called. So situation, task, activity, results. If I can find my narrative arc again, is essentially exposition is your situation. Task is what you needed to do to change it. So that could be your inciting incident. Um, activities, that's your rising action. And then your result is the, um, the climax or the um, thing at the top. So you can use that same narrative arc to tell the story and still answer your interview questions in the same way. Do you think that that's a useful um, mnemonic actually in terms of, or, or you know, useful useful method? The, the the star method does that does that cover enough of the arc in terms of uh, you know a good thing to rem remember? So when you're in the line of fire in a job interview and you're thinking, oh, what was that acronym that, that Sam said? Um, it, does that cover it? Is that a good memory aid? Yeah, the star can be a, a good memory. Star can be a good memory aid. I think, like anything, it's a structure. So it's worth being aware of when you're just using a structure and you're just recounting the details within a structure as opposed to when you're telling a story and there's a flow to it. So what that does is it enables you to take the structure and apply the flow of the of the story like we've seen today. And that right. hopefully would come across in an interview as a bit more human and a bit more kind of understandable. OK, thanks. Um, I've got a few questions coming through from the YouTube chat now. Um, so first one we've got, so someone said, thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to know if you always need a crisis in the, the narrative. You don't always, I think. Not every story comes with a crisis, um, but every story will come with a climax. And it just happens that um, uh, those two often are coupled in that you have opposing forces of good and evil that need to battle it out. Um, but no, you might not always have a crisis. Or then, you know, you might do something that... Um, is a project that goes swimmingly and actually um, you've got a really great story to tell of how successful it's been. One of my um, one of my personal opinions though is that we're very bad at talking about when bad stuff happens and we're very bad at sharing our failings and so working the crisis into it is a way of acknowledging where something may have failed or not gone quite as well as you thought it might and that's always really useful to people to know so um, don't shy away from crisis but you definitely don't always need them okay brilliant thanks Sam. Uh, another question here so um how can you uh okay so this is this is going back to in terms of the show and tell so some show and tells can be really dry <laughs> what's the what's the treat uh what's the trick for keeping them alive and uh how can you infect your teams with i, I think this means infect your teams with this idea of storytelling so any any tips for that yeah i mean I've been there. I've sat in show and tells where I've just thought, please make it stop, please. I think because we work on such a granular level sometimes, like when we're doing user testing, when we're changing really small bits of websites, but it has a big impact, we get very bogged down in the detail of the thing rather than in identifying what it was that helped us make a decision and how we moved on from that decision. And I think the key thing here is that, you know, I've rattled through the Tiger Game to Tea in 15 minutes. And that storytelling technique enables you to keep some pace, which I think is important. Um, the other thing is, so you asked about how you infect the team with it. My mantra is just bloody do it. Get on with it. You do it yourself and model the behaviours and see who comes along with you. People will. Um, and I, I think, you know, actually people start to um, see in stories something interesting that they take forward. Um, the other thing I would say in uh, show and tells is people have a tendency to be very um, linear in their narrative. So they think about what happened on a timeline as opposed to what happened in a narrative. And we know that agile doesn't really work on a timeline. It, it curls and it goes back on itself and it learns from itself. And you might find that you've got into a sprint up here but you've learned something back here, which informs where you go next. So it doesn't work on that, like week one, we did this, week two, we did this, week three, we did this, week four, we did this. It doesn't always work that way. So I would think as well about how you break up 
the story that you're telling and don't just tell it uh, as the time passed, if that makes sense. Like actually think about your narrative. Okay, so I can't see, I don't think there's any more questions. Just said uh, everyone else on the, uh, any volunteers, if there's any more questions, do fire them over. Um, I think we've probably, no, it looks like we've they've dried up. Maybe we've got a couple more, just, I have one more question actually, just uh, if that's all right. How, um, you were saying about just just get on and do it. And um, do you do you sort of talk about the importance of storytelling, or do you just focus on telling stories? And you know how how kind of how um, how much do you kind of share this idea at work, or do you just do it and hope that people kind of follow suit? Um, a bit of both. Uh, so I've this is now the third talk that I've given on story. No, fourth talk that I've given on storytelling. Um, but I bang on about it all the bloody time. Like there is a bit of, as as people on this call will probably understand, like there's a bit of tenacity needed to work in this field. Like you have, you end up saying the same things again and again and again. And um, I think partly it's demonstrating through doing and partly it's explaining why you're doing. So I do a lot of working in the open. Um, I write a lot of blogs and I um, just started a newsletter about, uh, writing week notes um, and bits and pieces um, so I think it's a little bit of both to be honest um, but what I think you'll find is you know like I said the people that are interested will follow you and then they will talk to someone else who will follow you see so you're never going to get everybody involved but if you get a few um, then it does start to kind of snowball out a little bit Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. I think we're probably going to need to wrap it up now. But just um, you mentioned your your writing and your week notes and your newsletter. Where can people find out more about you and read that stuff? Yeah. So uh, I have got my iPad. If you uh, head to Medium, I am Stamantha on Medium. But uh, if you do a search for the tiger who came to tea, everything that I've talked about today, I've actually written down into a workshop that you are very welcome to take and use and run with your teams. So if you do a Google search for um, telling the story of your project with the tiger who came to tea, you should find me. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I'm Stamanfa on Twitter. So if you follow your ex-Bristol, you should have seen me um, tagged into some tweets. Um, so yeah, I share things on there and you can sign up to my newsletter from there as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sam. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. So we're going to um, we're going to move on to our next talk now. Um, our next talk's from Candy Williams, and it's entitled "Great, they can find it, but can they understand it?" So hello, I'm Candy. I am a content design manager and content strategist at Nationwide. Um, I am also an author of books. One of the books is pictured there, but not my hand. <laughs> um, in my spare time, I like plants, wine, and writing stuff on Twitter. So if you have a burning desire to follow me, I'm at Candy Wright. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a topic that is very close to my heart in many ways um, and I'm going to cover off some of the principles of content and comprehension, why it's important and how we can measure it. So firstly, I think we can all agree that we've been talking about this and how content should come first in experiences for some time. We've been saying for many decades that content is king or queen and we've seen a massive rise in roles such as UX writing and content design. So why is it that in practice we are still seeing a whole lot of this in the design and even sometimes the research of our experiences, services and products? We're also hearing a whole lot of this. It's fair to say that written content is often seen as the little sister and more often than not becomes the most overlooked component in the design and research process. But when you look at that in context, here is an experience, a website without any written content and a handy banking app, and a super useful chatbot 
and a couple of our other favourites, just for good measure. Content matters. It's a determining factor and arguably the single most important thing as to whether we understand something or we have no idea what's going on, to reference a ref recent example. And that's important, right? Because if people can't understand something, they can't act on it. They can't complete their tasks. They can't make the right decisions. They can't make sense of the world. And why would we want to invest all of this time, energy, money, efforts, resources in creating these expensive and timely experiences if people can't understand them? Turning back a bit, and to be clear, these aren't new, new concepts. We might have new names for them, but the study of social linguistics, psycholinguistics, neurolinguistics, and the proven power of the impact that language can have on how we experience things and how we see the world is something that's been researched and studied for decades. Arguably, it's never been more important than it is right now. Why? For many reasons. The UK average reading age is nine years old and it seems to be falling rapidly. 1.7 million adults in the UK have literacy levels lower than that of an 11 year old. And 10% of the UK have some form of dyslexia. Content and making sure that people understand our content is pivotal to the success of our products, services and experiences. So how do we do it? Well, let's take a look at how we design and evaluate understanding in our content. Firstly, don't overlook readability. In short, the more readable content is, the less cognitive effort, the less brain power it takes for someone to process, which is important, of course. And there's many, many ways that we can check how readable our content is. We've got a number of indexes that you can see. So we've got the Flex Kincaid grade, which is arguably the most, most popular. We've got the Gunning Fog score, the Smog Index, and a number of others. They've been around for decades and studied for many, many years. But largely, they all take into account a number of components in terms of how they calculate readability. And they're looking at things like your sentence length, syllables, word count, character count, percentage of complex words, and passive voice. What they give us is they take that and they use it to come up with a score or a reading age that indicates how readable our content is. They serve a really important purpose in getting us to check ourselves and flag up any simple improvements that we can make to ensure that our content is more readable. And as we know, there are many things that are going to be out of our control. Things that might be prescribed to us, things that we have to say. There might be some instances where it's unavoidable to have a longer word count. But there are many, many things that are within our control, things that we can do that we know are proven to make our content more readable. Things like reducing our sentence length right down, making sure we're not using complex words for the sake of it, and avoiding unnecessary passive voice. Readability is important for a number of reasons. And one of those, as we touched upon before, is that the average reading age in the UK is nine years old. You might have heard this a lot, and it comes up a number of times. If you are in any space like mine, you will also have heard, but we don't write for nine-year-olds. Nine wasn't a number that was plucked out of thin air. It's a really significant milestone in people's reading development. For example, if you cover up 30% of the words on a page, a nine-year-old will still be able to accurately get some missing content. A lot of that is because by nine, we take a bit of a step change in terms of our reading development. We stop just reading and we start to understand. 
most nine-year-olds, most, are able to understand the meaning of what's been read or said. They can start to read between the lines and pick up on irony, tone, metaphor, point of view. And they can read most uncomplicated words without, with confidence. A really important point is they're starting to recognise simple words just by their shape. So the cognitive load is reducing. Interestingly, if you look at reading development after nine years old, it's relatively steady in comparison to the massive changes that happen in those first nine years. So you can see the significance of the nine-year-old reading age. What's really important to denote, however, is that your reading age isn't to do with your intelligence. It's not a competition, this isn't a spelling bee, as the Americans say. Your reading age can change based on your situation and your emotional state. In short, it's about speed and comprehension, not intellect. For example, your reading age might be completely different if you're carrying a baby in one arm and a bottle in the other, or if you're looking at a small screen. There's even been studies to suggest that having a cold can affect your reading age. It's a really important distinction, especially when we're talking or working with stakeholders, you might think, well, my product or service isn't targeted at nine-year-olds. That's not the point in any way, shape or form. Actually, writing to a lower reading age and being mindful of our readability of our content is beneficial for absolutely everyone. Another reason of many that it matters is because our brain doesn't process words unfamiliar words in the same way as ones we know. So how we process information is largely based on two factors. So how often we use a word and the age in which we learn it. So if you're dealing with or using words, line phrases like non-standard mortgage variable rate, we use them less often and we learn them later. So they're a lot harder for people to understand. This is really important for us as designers and creators of experiences, because every time we're using a word that's less familiar for people, we're making it harder for them to get what we're trying to say. Another important one for the digital world is that new flash, and I'm sorry, we don't really read online most of the time. We skim or we scan. And if we skim, then we're quickly reviewing information to get the gist of what it's about, but we're not taking it in. So we might do that with email, say, you've got another one come through the inbox and you skip, you're seeing, you know, what's it all about? Is it relevant to me? Scanning, we do this a whole lot. So we're flicking through news feeds, et cetera, and we're trying to find specific pieces of information or answers to our questions. Maybe we're looking for the best deal. We know what we've got our eyes on, essentially. These are very, very different types of digesting information than the traditional type of reading that we might be used to if we're reading Lord of the Rings or let's say the Da Vinci Code. And if you want to put this to the test, proofread. So whenever I'm proofreading something and making a conscious effort to read word for word, you notice the cognitive load and the strain immediately. It's very different to what we're used to day to day with our online experiences. So too long didn't read. If for whatever reason you switched off or you were busy skimming or scanning something else, here's some principles to keep in mind to help make your content more readable. Firstly, keep your sentences to no more than 20 words. Break those sentences up, front load them with the most important information as well. Avoid using passive voice as much as possible. It's not a hard and fast rule, but generally it's simpler for people to understand if they're writing in the active voice. So we're putting emphasis on the subject setting. So for instance, Candy did a talk on comprehension, not the talk was delivered on comprehension. 
Another really important one is use F people's everyday language, the language they know, they understand, they use, that they're searching for, that they're looking for. If you don't know it, find it out and we'll touch upon some ways to do this shortly. And don't use big words when simpler, smaller ones will do just fine. It's not big and it's not clever. There's been so many studies to show that even with lawyers, doctors, people who are used to complex jargon all day, every day, clarity always wins. And never ever assume understanding. If in doubt, test it out. As you all know, we're not our users. And if I had a penny for every time that I'd been surprised by comprehension testing, I'd have a lot more houseplants than I do right now. So, if readability is about knowing what something says, comprehension is about knowing what it means. There tend to be three levels of comprehension, in a nutshell. So you've got the surface level of comprehension, which is literal comprehension, and that's literally <laughs> understanding what something says. So you might be able to read the words, content design is amazing, for example, but I have no idea what that actually means in context. And you see this a lot in child language acquisition, hence that why phase that people go through. You've then got inferential comprehension, which is where you're reading between the lines more and you're drawing on prior knowledge to gain patterns in meaning, applying what you know to what you're reading. And this is where mental models come in a lot. And then at the highest end of the pyramid, you've got evaluative comprehension. So this is when you're bringing in and applying your own thoughts and beliefs to what you're reading or hearing, which brings to the forefront all kinds of connotations. This is incredibly important with inclusive language and tone. Just one word can mean and trigger so many things to so many different people. So it's really important that we're thinking about the way our language makes people feel. So how to measure comprehension. I'm going to run through a few of my favourite ways of measuring comprehension. Firstly, the closed test. So closed tests were designed to measure comprehension. And with a closed test, you essentially blank out every six word of a passage text. And if people get 60% of the blanks right, it gives you an indication that they have a good general understanding of its meaning. However, we found this really, really useful to identify synonyms in people's everyday language. So a few examples would be on gaps where we've had words like ordinary, we found that most people would replace it with normal, which makes complete sense, right? Because it's a word people probably heard earlier in life and they use more often. Similarly with cash machine, they might replace it with words like cash point. Again, a word that they're more familiar with or use more often. And we've seen the same with things like upgrade and extension. Another way of looking at comprehension is using a trusty highlighter test. So with highlighter tests, users are asked to highlight certain parts of the text in different colours. And they might be highlighting to represent a number of things. So this could be which part of the text are clear, which parts could be clearer, which part of the text make you feel confident or less confident in our service which parts of the text are friendly or formal. This is really useful because it gives us a good indication of any themes or struggles with people lit people's literal and inferential comprehension of our content. It's really good for literally highlighting any red flags or things that you need to go away, re-look at and iterate on. You can also pair it with some call interviewing, so you can dig a bit deeper onto the responses that people have got, so you've got the what and the why. Reaction testing. So this is an adaptation of Microsoft's product testing methods, which is really good for getting a deeper understanding into how people feel about the content. 
We've previously done it in lab testing with cards, but it can be adapted as part of surveys or remote testing. Typically, you would select a wide range of words that might well align with hypotheses that you have about the content. For instance, you might have too long or friendly, formal, helpful, confusing, and a number of others. What's really useful, we found, is that by having the cards and letting people take control in that way, it reduces the impact of them feeling like they're perhaps going to offend content that's been written or um, they're saying something face to face that maybe isn't what they perceive that you want to hear. And we found it kind of elicits some really useful themes and honest results. Recall. Good old recall. You can't beat a bit of it. So recall is where you're prompting users to play back or recall the understanding of the content that they've seen, read, heard. And it's a really good way of getting a true understanding of people's actual understanding by inviting them to play it back in their own words. You can use open questions to do this. And obviously, you know, you're going to facilitate it in a way that makes people feel comfortable. So asking them as part of qual interviews, what the cooling off period was for a credit card or to replay something in their own words now they've had a chance to read through the page what do they understand about it it gives you a really good perspective of how much people are actually taking in which bits are they skimming scanning which bits are they linking back to their own evaluative meaning it's a really really useful tool that should never be overlooked Finally, in the toolbox, copytesting.com. This is a really useful tool I've been using lately, especially now we're in remote times. And it has similar functions to a highlighter test, but also asks a number of open questions. And you can set these, or you can choose from some really useful questions that they've got about things like people's first reaction. Um, why are they highlighting things as clear or not very clear? The questions really help get the full picture, so getting people to think about the why as well as the what that they've highlighted. So there are things like, as you can see, someone rated this block of text as poor because it's full of jargon or good because it interested me. How they work is they come together um, to give you a clarity score, which is based on how clear your content is, and a care score, which is based on how relevant it is. These can be done at scale as well. So they're a really useful tool that anyone can use easily. Okay, so there's some of the tools covered off. Here's some things to think about when you're testing for comprehension. First things first, facilitation and framing is even more important with comprehension testing. No one likes a spelling test. The word alone can trigger all kinds of feelings for people. So make it even clearer than you would normally that you're not testing them. If anything, they're testing us and helping us make our content clearer, more useful and easy to understand for people. This has been a really interesting challenge when doing some of these methods remotely in terms of how we frame them. When you're facilitating, you've got the body language um, and you know the right things to say, etc. So we've had to pilot and test and learn to make sure that we're framing these methods to make them not only as clear as possible, but to make people feel as comfortable as possible with what they're being asked to do. Secondly, give people space and time. These methods can work well, unmoderated, and we found actually that we get some really honest response from people when we're not kind of there with them and they're kind of handing it, it back to us. What we would do in a lab is sometimes we might leave the room for a few minutes while someone was completing one of the exercises and come back and talk and talk through it so they didn't feel like we were peering over their shoulder in a teacher-like fashion. Thirdly, always triangulate. So as I mentioned earlier, readability scores give an estimate. They give the what. 
if you combine these with some of the comprehension evaluation methods, you start to build up the full picture. They all give you slightly different things, but when you bring it together, you can get a really good understanding of how well people can read what you're saying, how well they can understand it, and how it makes them feel, building up through those different levels of comprehension we spoke about. Finally, invite your trickiest stakeholders along. This is a brilliant one for solving any opinion-based arguments about jargon or acronyms or things you absolutely must say to be compliant. Putting the right people in front of real users who are all saying they don't understand something is a great case to improve it and make it clearer. Too long? Didn't listen? Essentially, it's really not enough just to write any old words and expect the people to care, understand and act on them, especially not when we're investing so much in the creation and design of experience. It's pivotal to consider language comprehension when we're testing experiences and services. However we're doing it, if it's moderated, unmoderated, there are ways that we can bring this through. Without it, we're not getting the full picture of how well our experiences and services and products resonate with users. Finally, our job as designers, researchers, etc. is to pass on information in the way that people understand. If they don't understand it, we failed our mission. Thank you. Now for any questions. If you have any further questions as well, you can tweet me at Candy Writes. I love talking about linguistics, comprehension, content design. So yeah, more than happy to continue the conversation. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hi everyone, thanks, uh, thanks so much Candy uh, for your fantastic talk. Thank you. And uh, there's some questions that come through from uh, the YouTube um, comments, if that's all right, I'll pass some over to you now. So our oh, first question, um, where can we find your toolbox for content design? My toolbox, wow, that's a bold question. Um, so I thought about this. I didn't necessarily talk about some of the tools that we use in, in specific. So um, for readability, my favorite tool is Readable, um, but WebFX readability tool is, yeah, it's really good as well. Um, copy testing is another one that um, I would check out and, and have a look at. So I'd say that, yeah, top three, for readability and comprehension for sure. And what are they candy are those apps or those websites or um where can people website okay I'll um I will I'll put them all on Twitter as well in case people yeah didn't catch them. And what's your um I can't remember your Twitter Twitter handle where, where can people find you on Twitter? Um at Candy Rights. Awesome okay brilliant thank you very much right some more they're coming through thick and fast okay so how would someone who's currently working in social media content or copywriting get into content design? That's a really, really good question. Um, one thing that I would say is think about the elements um, of what you're doing at the moment that align with content design. So there's, there's definite overlaps. Um, and I would say, especially in the social media space, there will be lots of um, understanding, yeah, people's sentiment, et cetera, and, and designing content accordingly. Think about how you're using insight in what you're doing, involving users um, and always identifying user needs, etc. So I would start by identifying some of the overlaps 
Um, and then also there's some just really, really good content design resources. So there's UX Writing Hub, um, there's a content strategy podcast. So I think just listening um, and reading up on content design, yeah, as, as much as you can. And also like chat to other content designers. So we've got around 20 content designers at Nationwide and not I'm not picking on anyone, but I'm sure, yeah, many would be happy to have a little chat about the role and what it entails and, and I am too. So yeah there's lots of there's lots of overlap um I came from a copywriting background many years ago um and so did lots of other people so yeah it's absolutely possible and you'll probably find that lots of what you're already doing um aligns with content design generally okay and you were saying in terms of uh, con uh, getting contact with other content designers are there any kind of meetup groups or uh, online groups or easy ways for people to find those sorts of people yeah, that's a good question. Again, there's not enough. There's not enough um, content meetups. It's something we've been talking about quite a lot at the moment. Um, content Design London have just started doing virtual meetups, which will be good. There's a UX and content, so it's just called um, Content Plus UX Slack yeah. group, which is also great. So I'll join that and um, yeah, absorb yourself in those conversations um, as well. All right, thanks, Candy. So there's loads of questions coming through. You might need to dive onto uh, YouTube after this, actually, because we're bound to run out of time and answer some questions. But another one now. So when is the most important time to check for readability? Before creating a design, during or after? That's a good, good, good question. And I would say all three. So definitely before, like baseline and check what you've got so you, so you kind of know what you're pitching at. Um, and then start to think about so as well as the score of the readability, that's, you know, as important as some of the things that are driving that. So you start to look at, you know, is it because of your sentence length? Is it because of your complex words per sentence, etc.? And then start to get um, an idea of where you could be going. I would say during when you're iterating that content as well. So we will like um, design content in readable um, sometimes as well. And then after is really important. So you can look at where you were and um, where you go. So yeah, all three. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one on a similar line, actually. That's just, it might be a slight duplicate. Let's go, go for it. Um, how does content testing fit into the product testing research? Can the findings be combined or synthesized with other research findings? Or does content yeah. testing need to be done separately? Yeah, good question as well. So we... We've tried to combine it as much as we can. So I would say readability testing can be done um, standalone. So you can do a readability audit, but content and comprehension testing, we would try and combine it with usability generally because you know no one wants to pay for two separate sets of participants, etc. So we'd design the sessions to bring them both together. So we might, you know, have the first half um, looking at usability and depth interviews, and then doing some specific comprehension and testing tasks. But it's something that you can do guerrilla as well. So oh sorry, sorry, someone's someone's at the door. Um, but yeah, it's a it's it's a mix. So yeah, I would definitely say that it can be, it can definitely be part of the process, but there might be times that, yeah, it, it can stand alone as well. Okay, we, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I can't see any more questions. If there, if there are any other questions that'll appear in the chat in a minute, I'll, I'll feed those back to you. I, I had a question actually in terms of like, where the content comes from. Like so often I've worked on projects where there has been no content and I've been like the information architect without any information to architects, which has always been a bit baffling. But do you, are you starting writing content from the how does that work for you? Do I start writing content from? It's like the very beginning of the project. Like, at what point does that start? Yeah, so we, we're lucky in the sense that we work really closely with um, UX and typically UI designers right from the start of the, the project. And for me, that's the absolute best way because yeah, that design process needs to kind of happen at the beginning. You need to start thinking about the information and how you're getting that across really early on. It's really important to be embedded in the research phase as well. So upfront understanding, yeah, user needs, et cetera. Um, I, if I'm honest, I think where it can go wrong is when content's too late in the process um, and it doesn't really work for anyone. And when it's just kind of getting handed over as a thing and then there's no iteration so my general advice would be the more you can work together um with content at all stages like the better the better it is 
Right, okay. And uh, we've got one final question and, and probably about a minute left, if that's all right. But uh, um, the age old question of how many participants, so you said you're going to you're going to sort of test the content alongside the user testing. How many people do you want to be looking at this to get some useful insights? Again, it's a hard, it's a difficult one to answer because it depends. <laughs> Such a long answer. Um, but we've done like highlighter testing, unmoderated, and you're looking at like, you know, 100, 100 people that you're kind of testing it with. But then we've also done it in lab sessions when it's with six um, people. So it's really, it's really varied. And I always think of, all of them are just giving you signals really to build a bigger picture so the more that you can get and sometimes you might only be able to do readability testing and that's fine um, but other times the more that you can kind of combine readability and comprehension testing to build to build a bigger picture um, yeah it's great I think some work better um, on larger scales as well because you can start to identify themes so closed testing um, the more people you can get the more you can start to yeah understand the full picture um, and see if there's themes and patterns but yeah it's it's kind of nudging it along and, and getting as much as you can in there brilliant all right Candy well thank you so much I think we've run out of time now but thank you so much for your fantastic talk and uh, I'm sure if you've got time there, there'll be possibly some more questions for you on the YouTube stream so if people want to contact you it's Candy Wrights on Twitter yeah yeah awesome right thanks so much Candy thank you happy Friday <laughs> okay so our, our next talk is from Rita Rita Savetto and uh, the talk is service design in tech Hello everyone, um, welcome to Service Design in Tech. Uh, I'm Rita Servetto, a service designer uh, working at Calusa. So before we dive into the talk, I wanted to do a little warm up exercise as if we were in the same room. I, initially, this was going to be a one to one situation face to face, but here we are, COVID in it. So what I'd like to do first is ask you to please grab a piece of paper or maybe you can open a note on your computer and I want you to jot down what's in your mind. This can be either a task or a thought or a feeling, something that's just right there. I'll give you a minute to do it. You good? Thank you. Thanks for that. The reason we've done that is so that we're allowing our brains to focus in the next uh, half an hour together. And that thought will still be there by the time I'm done. So I wanted to start by showing you where I work. This is um, uh, an office that I miss a lot. I haven't been there for four months now. It feels like ages. So I work at a company called Calusa. Calusa is part of the OVO group. And Calusa is a tech company. Um, my main role as a service designer at Calusa is to make sure that the platform we're building works, obviously, effectively, um, but also it's useful to its users, both energy retailers and end users like you or me consuming energy. Our platform is to serve millions of people, as I've said, um, different people, and that these people need to accomplish things like uh, moving home and sorting their energy in their new place and what happens if someone unfortunately dies at the account needs to change owner or how can we help users avoid debt um, by explaining how to manage their energy better. Energy really is quite connected to how people feel about their finance and how comfortable they are with that. So it's less transactional than what it seems on the surface. I really enjoy being a service designer in this space. Um, but what was I doing before? So this is a picture of me in 2017. Uh, that's actually a unicorn hoodie. You can't see it, but if you put it over your head, it has a horn. Anyway, so when I saw the job description a year and something ago, this was my reality. I came from... Um, agency. I came from consultancy, from maybe smaller projects, projects that would end um, eventually. 
like this one, for example, as I was saying. So this is for a pharmacy where we did a, a piece on discovery around prescriptions. So it involved going into the pharmacy and interviewing people and talking to people in the back office and to customers, just being out there. And I love that. We went across the country and that's this is all I knew. I did similar projects for the NHS blood and transplant organization and insurance at the club and just awesome places to really go and, and learn and try different approaches to user centricity and human centered design. The thing is that I was worried about not having any background in energy when I saw the job description at uh, Calusa. So yeah, I felt that I wasn't going to do it well. And I felt that all the designers that I knew either worked in consultancy or government. I just didn't know where to turn. In any case, I thought that the opportunity was really tempting, so I went in. When I went in, though, my leap of faith was rewarded. This is a little group picture of the amazing crew, the awesome, incredible crew of UX designers across Ova Group. Massive shout out to Paul Matson, Ben Garvey Coburn, and James Cook. You're probably watching this. You're awesome. And you helped me find my feet really fast. What I found when I joined OVO was um, an amazing group of people, of UXers, doing um, work around specific touch points and specific journeys. What I wanted to do upon joining was to solve problems at a more end to end um, way or in, um, or in a more holistic way, looking at journeys that maybe touch several touch points at the same time. UXers and designers are not that different, really. So we both uncover needs, really, and we're trying to solve problems for people. However, service designers take a look at business process as well, and we take a look at other users, not only the, the user interacting with one touch point. I, I'd say that's how I see the main difference. We also, service designers also borrow tools from user research, from change management, from rapid prototyping with almost anything, um, business analysis, um, even theater, actually. And this, what you can see here, is my favorite method of service prototyping called body storming. I absolutely love it. It's fancy title for acting. It can be a way to immerse yourself in the environment of the service. So you can maybe go and be a patient in a hospital to see what it's like. But it can also be recreating that environment and um, experiencing it in your own space. What you see here is us acting out what it's like to move home all of the parties involved, the customer, the customer care agent, finance, everyone was in the room. And we were playing it, the, the whole thing, end to end, seeing where the pain points were and what the um, improvements could be. This is the kind of stuff that I was hoping to do more and more, but from the beginning. So it was really hard to define how to do this kind of work from the beginning, how to do end-to-end -end design when teams weren't set up that way, necessarily. So yeah, that was a challenge at the beginning. So how could I add value? I was looking online for advice. I read some reports on the value of uh, business in design. Uh, this is one from McKinsey. I recommend it, of course. And also the John Maeda's reports on design in tech. They're great. The challenge is that I couldn't find anything to apply. So I wanted to practice something. After trying different things, slash failing at different things, um, I noticed that service design really has certain methods that need to change. As soon as you go in tech, they need to change especially research, my methods essentially needed to change to allow for two things, speed and resistance. So what do I mean by speed? I mean, what do I mean by speed? I mean agile product development. I mean being surrounded by product-focused people, people that are thinking delivery, not necessarily human-centered design. Um, it was very different to working in consultancy. It's a different environment. People focused on shipping product rather than asking what we need to build. Iteration and learning from working code is really good. It's great. I'm not saying that's bad at all. But it can mean that people get caught up 
in building. And uh, this talk from Melissa Perry is quite good. It's about the uh, concept of build trap. She's written a book about this too. And it's when people keep asking, what's the next thing? What should we build? What should we build? And forget actually to go outside and check in with customers to see if what's being built is really, really useful. The danger of the build trap felt very real to me at the beginning, probably because of my untrained eyes to be inside a tech company. And yeah, I wasn't used to it. Resistance to do research felt like the evil twin of speed. They would always show up together. Um, to be fair, it's not uncommon. It's not something that just happens in some companies. 40% of companies admitted to not talking to their end users during development, according to this report. But I don't trust reports, <laughs> not all of them necessarily. So I wanted to sense check with uh, colleagues, people that I work with and that I know personally. And I asked them if they thought that things needed to change in the way they, that designers work with product and tech. Most people said yes. And most people said that we're going in the right direction, so that's okay. And the second biggest group said that drastic change is needed. An interesting quote that I want to share with you was, As a researcher within a top-down hierarchical company that focuses on sales over user experience, it feels nearly impossible to push for more research activities. The good news is that there is method in the badness. It wasn't just crazy running towards delivery modes. What I was seeing, what I was witnessing was people in a product team delivering code based on a roadmap. And that's the method in the madness. If you can participate in the creation of that roadmap and contributing to it and shaping it, then you can avoid the well means, I call them, the well means that um, a fast, iterative, agile approach can bring on to you as a service designer. You will essentially have less resistance because you'll know what happens when. I was a bit too happy with myself when I discovered this, so I thought I'd check in with someone else. I want to introduce you to Radina. She, I used to work with her in a previous life in consultancy. So I asked her if she thought that the only way to do meaningful research was by having a roadmap. She's currently a user researcher at N26 in Berlin. This is her take on roadmaps and research. I agree and disagree because there's two types of research. One is generative that informs the roadmap and the other one is evaluative um, that is actually just validating whether what was on the roadmap made sense and um, they go hand in hand. Um, so while I am doing eval um, generative research, like explore explorative and um, answering big strategic questions, I'm also running user interviews just to do usability testing on things that we've researched the previous quarter. It quite messes with my mind to zoom in and zoom out of these big questions and small questions, but it's actually a good game to play and um, it's good to play back to your team as well and keep everyone engaged about the big questions that are informing the vision and also the, the small usability questions that are informing their day-to-day -day work. So is that it? Roadmaps? That's the solution to doing service design in tech? Nope. Um, adapting your research to fit for roadmaps is one thing. You will also find that you have to adapt ideation methods and prototyping methods and all of the other things that you used to do before need to allow for speed and resistance now. So I've been keeping the most important thing for last. Um, what's crucial, what I found to be most important for me to do service design in tech was to think of the people I work with as my most important asset. They would help me find my way around the organization and they could point out what the driving forces were around the organization to make sure added value. Coming from agency or consultancy means that maybe like me, you have a little bit of inertia. So you're always performing and it's always, you know, for the client. It turns out that when you join, you have to turn that down and listen and be open and receive feedback and meet people. It doesn't come naturally at all. So I'm not going to tell you to do it because I didn't know how to do it. I'm going to let Camila explain it in her words. I asked her what advice she would give someone like me. 
use your first 90 days in a new company, but I'd give this kind of advice to anybody, either joining a remote team or somebody joining in a pre-COVID situation. The first, the first three months you have in a company are the best because you get to question everything and challenge everything and nobody, nobody tells you anything. Everybody's pretty open to your feedback because you have fresh eyes and you have a, a new perspective on things ask lots of questions. There are no stupid questions and most definitely not for the first three months. So ask, don't be afraid, don't be shy. Use your, use your first three months. I personally used my first couple of months um, in doing a service blueprint. I'd recommend that approach. It worked really well and it meant that my first batch of allies came to find me soon after I started. What I did was define the purpose and scope of the map with my amazing product director, Cassie, shout out. Thank you very much. And then I conquered a massive space in the hallway of where we work, very public, where everyone walks. Unfortunately, it was on the way to the bathroom, but that's another story. Um, yeah, so <laughs> then I stuck four meters of paper on the wall. And on this picture, you can see how it kept iterating. So I'd send it to print, send it back, and update it, and bring people to the wall. And it got people from customer care, from the BAs, from different parts of the business commenting on how useful a map like this could be. On this picture, you can see someone pointing at their own map. So people picked the format and made their own version. So the people that got in touch as a result of the map were not the end. That's not, you just, making friends is important, but that's not the point. What was valuable about that is the feedback that I got from them. So Nina, for example, design lead at Calusa, spoke to me, uh, to me about her view on how service design adds value at different levels. That's another takeaway. I'll let her explain. She does it better than me. Service design is essential at a level across multiple teams to kind of connect dots between teams and connect dots between the organization. With service design, I think it's, you know, having that documentation at each level from team to squad to org to, you know, and numbers of entities that you work with is important, but you can't possibly kind of present that information all the time to everyone whenever. So I think the job of service design is to say, okay, well, we have these living artifacts, these these things that document what's going on, um, and we have them at different levels. You know who else is awesome? Product people. And by that, I mean maybe product managers or product owners. They have different names in different companies. But to really get into their mindset and see how alike we are, designers and product managers, I recommend the book Inspired by Marty Kagan. Very, very good book. And it'll show you how passionate product managers are about solving problems, people problems. You could pair that up with Lean UX and good services. So you have a view of how to do UX inside tech and good services to make sure you stay true to designing holistic experiences that allow people to get to the goal that they have. Inside um, Lean UX and Inspired, you'll maybe pick up something called Dual Track Agile. Dual Track Agile is probably my biggest find of 2020. It's allowed me to connect with people that are very close to the Agile methodology and be able to speak to them about user needs and be able to talk to them about discovery. The method essentially allows for research and product delivery to be happening at the same time. You have two tracks, as you can see here, and the discovery backlog, as you're finding what problems are there, you can feed some of them, validated ideas, into the delivery backlog. So it goes really fast. You know, it's... It moves onto the, the speedy layer of um, the tracks and then gets shipped and then you learn from it. It's amazing, but it's really hard to implement. After having shared the idea with people at work, we're all talking about how we can make this happen across the company so all teams feel equipped to run dual track. If you want to know more about where Kalusa or myself are headed, I recommend watching this talk from our design director, her name's Yolanda Martin Olivas, and she used to work at Farfetch before and has loads of experience building platforms and using service design actually as a tool 
for organizational change. It's very interesting. You can use the shortened link as well if you want to type it in, watch it later. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it up here. What I really hope is that you say yes to a challenging role in tech in the coming months, maybe years. Um, I hope that you feel that you can adapt your methods to different environments so you can reshape them and make them more flexible to fit for speed and resistance. And I also have loads to learn. So please tell me what you know. Get in touch. All my details are somewhere near this video. So I'd love to hear from you and uh, learn how to make tech more human-centered. That's all, friends. My God, this was nerve-wracking. It's over now. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay, thanks very much, Rita. It's a fantastic talk. I mean, an amazing presentation there. Um, very retro, old school style. Um, and we've got Rita here to um, answer a few of the questions that have been raised in the chat. Um, so first of all, Rita, um, we've got a question which says, um, what are some of the essential or necessary questions that you ask your client? Um, is there a specific set of questions that you, that you ask? I wish there was. If anyone has any, please send them my way. I think the most important question is always why. And I am, I'm guessing that when we say client, we mean subject matter expert or the person on the other side. I'm assuming that that's what the question referred to. Um, always ask why, and it's not about getting the answer, it's about solving it together. So ask why and take them to show you, make it a, a little walk towards something that is tangible. But yeah, why is basically the one to start with. You keep asking why, why Forever. and why again. <laughs> yeah. um, James Bird question, actually, um, he said, um, was putting the blueprint near to the toilet deliberate? I'd Sounds like a shrewd move for good exposure. I don't know if that's the right word to use, but it's... Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. If you take anything from this talk is uh, everyone goes to the bathroom and if you have something that they need to see, that's probably the place to put it. I'm being very real. I haven't found a way to change this for COVID times, but I'll, I'm sure I'll mm. figure something out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toilets and coffee areas, I think, where people are kind of yeah milling around. So um, great. Um, a question from Nick Price. Um, in your experience, where is the best place for service design to sit in the org chart? I think I, culturally, where does it mm -hmm. sit? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that service design necessarily belongs in the org chart. I've always thought of it as um, a column in parallel to this triangle of a classic hierarchy of a company and service design is, is there to support any level and in different ways because what we're doing is deconstructing what we are certain of and asking why so we can help teams to solve maybe one design challenge for one page but we can also help leadership think about a strategy for maybe where the company wants to go and how we can add value. So I'd say it is at every level. It's just knowing what you're doing and what level you're trying to influence that matters. So you don't get it wrong like I have. It's beautiful, don't do that. <laughs> um, just following on from that, I guess what one question is, do you need high level buy-in to it? Well, regardless of where it kind of culturally sits, I mean, do you need to have someone at the top who's a champion for service design to make it, to make it work, do you think? Um, I would be very careful to say that service design needs buy-in because um, the title is very buzzwordy. So I wasn't actually hired as a service designer. I was hired as a senior UXer because the title doesn't matter. The work is what matters. So it doesn't matter what they call it. They can call me a potato. That's fine. The point is, can I add value to strategic conversations, to more tactical conversations? That's really the juice. It doesn't matter. Okay, great. Um... And uh, somebody said, is there a list of resources or links that, um, that we can share? I mean, I think that applies to all talks and we'll probably will follow up on that with some of the other, other speakers, but are there any, any resources? You, you mentioned um, some of the books, I think I've got, which was, that one was one of them? Yes. So, <laughs> just hand delete it there. So can we post maybe on the Miro or something? We can put in a few key resources for people. Maybe other speakers could do that as well. That might be a, 
um, a, a useful way forwards. A hundred percent. I've got a favorite list and I'll just drop it on Mira in a second. Fantastic. Um, another question, does your service design blueprint still get used? And if it is, how has it evolved? That's a, that's so, a good because of COVID, I've done a video run through. As you can tell, I love I love me a video editing challenge. So I've done a, an audio run through, and it's uh, helping people on board. We are hiring at the moment. So, how do you absorb four meters of content? I've turned it into something watchable. In seventeen minutes, you can run through it. And I guess it is in Confluence. It's being used by uh, teams to understand and then do their own smaller version of the service blueprint with more detail. It's there. I'd say right now this week, I'm, I'm doing a new version of it because it's already out of date. So it never ends. And how do you, how do you communicate with them about the, the changes? Are, you, are, you, are they kind of communicating with you to say, you know, what's the latest? Or are you kind of having to go and, you know, beat on the door and say, look, listen, you know, I've got this, you must take notice of it. What, how does that work? It's a cycle. If you imagine a cycle of, hey, where can we see that blueprint? Oh, I don't know. Is it here? Oh, by the way, it's updated. This is new. So it's a, it's a conversation. There's people asking me for it and people sending me updates. And at the moment, what I'm doing is uh, with Nina, who you saw on the talk, we're collating latest maps. So from the last six months, we're asking all of the designers, have, have you mapped anything? Can we, can we take a look? So we make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel. It's a conversation. It, it's it's a matter of keeping it going, like the walks to the bathroom. You gotta keep them going, <laughs> and like blah blah blah. Make it casual. It's just yeah. you stocking. So you encourage people to go to the toilet, and then everything will be fine. So I mean, <laughs> if that if that's what you take from the conversation, I think that's healthy. So it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, another question: Do you include people outside the team for the um, for the acting process? I guess this goes back to the the body storming. Do you yeah. want to talk to I think you know, people may not be aware of body storming necessarily as a term. Um, so do you want to just talk us through that a little bit about what you've done and what it involves? A hundred percent. You can find more details on this on a book called Game Storming, which I'll also drop a link to. And uh, body storming is role playing. You really have to read the room. You cannot ask maybe uh, the C-suite to just walk in and put on funny hats and act something out. Again, something I learned. So I would say prep people, brief them, tell them why, tell them what. And what you do is get in a room, dress it up, put maybe this is going to represent this, this is going to represent that. Da, da, da. So you're, you're creating like your theater. And based on the brief, you just say, OK, we're going to play now. How does a person move home? You're going to be the customer. You're going to be on the call center. I will pretend to be the system that we're building. So I'll talk about the things that I am recording and I'm learning. And you, you'll stop at every like 10 seconds because it doesn't work. When you play out a service, you'll see all the gaps and the problems and the inconsistencies. It's beautiful. It, it takes a while, but it's a great way to live the thing that you're building. Fantastic. Um, got one more question perhaps. Um, so I, I, was, I have a question actually, which is about, I mean, you mentioned about almost a, the, the shock of going into this environment where it's about you know the build trap we must be building and it's agile and there's this focus on an output all of the time compared to maybe a more of a consultancy approach where you yeah. have the freedom to kind of explore and do all this generative research yeah what would you say i mean can you compare those two approaches what do you lose from the the build trap if, if anything what, what are the constraints of doing it that way and what are the benefits of, of doing it that way would you say if I understand your question, what is good and what is bad about the build trap? Well, compared to a, you know the build trap in that sort of agile environment where it is you, you're off and you're doing stuff, compared uh -huh. to maybe a, a more of a consultancy approach where mm -hmm. you've got a bit of time to do some sort of generative research and service design, and there's not necessarily you know it might be f feeding into some sort of prototyping and what have you further down the line. What's what are the kind of strengths and weaknesses of, of those approaches? The build trap, yeah, it's it's a tricky one because I think it's less about the method and mo more what adds value at what point. So you will need to do some discovery at one point, whether you do it fast, slow, during the build, after, at the same time, it doesn't matter as long as it happens. Um, that's the good thing about discovery, you're spending time with the problem. That's the good thing. I'd say the bad thing about the build trap is that you're not necessarily spending time with the problem, you're spending time with the solution. 
So you fall in love with the solution, the solution takes on a life of its own, and then you've emotionally invested in it, and you're out with something that maybe doesn't actually solve a problem. So if you could, you could have a bit of both, then things should go okay. Or maybe you can have like two people in the team that think that one or the other is important. So they like talk about it and make it happen at the same time, maybe. Okay, yeah, so diverse views, kind of trying to, you know, research that and find out which the, the, the best approach is to take forward, so. Exactly, tension for design, you want Fantastic. that. Up to a point. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I think that's uh, we'll, we'll we'll stop there. But thank you so much, Rita. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so um, next up is uh, Joe Niles, who's going to be talking. Uh, his, his talk is the the Stoic Designer. So um, Joe's been in the field of UX research and design for over a decade. Um, with an he's got an academic background in psychology and ergonomics, and he's a uh, currently working for the Mensa. So um, over to you, Joe, to talk about the Stoic Designer. Uh, the host has disabled attendee screen sharing. Ah, apologies. Carry on, I will sort that out for you as we go. Right. Okay. There you go, you should be able to share now. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. So in 2016, my life was in a bit of a mess. It was a time of great change. I had separated from my wife of eight years. Uh, she had moved away 200 miles away um, with my 18 month old daughter. I was living in a shared house for the first time since I was a student. Uh, work was was really difficult work was really trying but people gave me the advice at the time that I shouldn't leave because there was so much going on that I'd be better off staying where I was and keeping at least one thing stable the, the problem I was having with work is that they, they understood very little uh, they understood very little about UX they understood very little about digital accessibility I was on a project that had been going on for well over a year uh, there was no end in sight uh, and I was quite angry a lot of the time and I should point out before I go any further that now I'm a principal UX consultant at the Mensa. I'm talking about a different job. I'm not just ragging on my current employer. Back then I was a senior UX architect at a shipping company. And it was one of those places that has a dress code uh, as if you know having a dress down on one particular day affects your ability to do creative work. And that, that kind of old school attitude was reflected in the, the leadership and the culture. There were a lot of good things. There was a lot of good people. There was a lot of uh, very competent people. But I wasn't dealing with the work that I was doing very well. It was a lot of emotion. So I had no framework with which to deal with all of the different things that were going on. How do you deal with all of those things going on at once? People talked to me about self-care, which was a term that I hadn't heard, but a concept I knew. So doing exercise, good food, sleeping, good people. But what do you do when you've got so many thoughts? There was just so many thoughts. And then my brother gave me this. So this is, as it says on the cover, a daily stoic journal. And what it does is it separates each week into a theme, a stoic theme. And then each day within that week, it asks a question. And you have a few lines to write a morning reflection and a few lines to write uh, an evening reflection. And it was my introduction to stoicism. So some examples of the questions are, how will I turn today's adversities into advantages? Can I go a whole day without blaming others? Where can I better play to my strengths? Which might sound a little bit corny, but if you know anything about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a, an intervention that aims to improve mental health by focusing on challenging and changing unhelpful cognitive distortions and behaviors, which is actually based on a lot of stoicism, it's about hammering away at themes. So you don't, get, you don't start changing your mindset after doing it for one day, but over time, over the course of a year, it can really start to affect the way you think about things. So what is Stoicism? Well, it was founded in Athens by Zeno of Citium in the early fourth century BC. There are modern Stoics, but I just want to start with the founding fathers because these, the, these are the lads that kind of kick things off and the ones that you hear about the most. So there's Seneca, the younger, 
he was around just before Christ to just after. He was born a tutor and later an advisor to the Emperor Nero. Uh, he was um, born in Cor Cordoba and he died in Rome when Nero ordered him to kill himself, which he did. The next one is Epictetus, whose name I haven't had to pronounce until I started doing this talk, so I've got no idea if I'm getting it right. He was around a little bit later, so 55 to 135 AD. He was born a slave in one day Turkey, then moved to Rome and then to Greece. The next one I think is probably the one that most people would have heard of, if any. This is Marcus Aurelius. So he was around later still, 121 to 180 AD. He was a Roman emperor for the last 19 years of his life and was seen as the last emperor of the Pax Romana, which was an age of relative peace and stability. He actually had 13 children uh, married to his cousin. But the thing about these guys is that they were warriors and they saw a lot of death, they saw a lot of waste, and they vowed to live life to the fullest as a result. Stoicism's had a bit of a resurgence since about 2012. There are probably loads of uh, Stoics around, but it, it's difficult to find. They're not necessarily celebrities. I don't know how many of them on Love Island have, have got into Stoicism. It might be all of them, I don't know. But some more famous names from more recent times. So. Roosevelt, who was the US president for 12 years from the Great Depression through to the end of World War II, had a debilitating illness, meaning he could, uh, he could hardly walk and he could hardly stand. Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, politics aside, was the UK prime minister during the 80s where there were strikes, there was the Falklands War, there was a lot of change and adversity. Uh, and Viktor Frankl, who uh, actually survived Auschwitz. So Stoicism, asserts that virtue is the only good and that judgment should be based on behavior rather than words. That we don't control and cannot rely on external events, only ourselves and our responses. It's got a few central teachings. So how unpredictable the world can be, how brief our moment of life is, how to be steadfast and strong and in control, and that the source of our dissatisfaction lies in our impulsive dependency on our reflexive senses rather than logic. It doesn't concern itself with complicated theories about the world. It's not like existentialism, uh, but it's about helping to overcome destructive emotions and act on what can be acted upon. So it's built for action and practice, not endless debate. It's about trying to get better, whatever that means. I suppose more virtuous would be a better way to put it. And these are the four virtues that it's based on. So wisdom, the ability to think and act using knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense and insight. Courage, also termed fortitude, forbearance, strength, endurance, and the ability to confront fear, uncertainty, and intimidation. Temperance, the ability to discern the appropriate course of action to be taken in a given situation at the appropriate time. And justice, also considered fairness. Now, how much do you wish, looking at that list, that every leader that you knew, in design or otherwise, actually displayed these characteristics a lot more? It, it might seem like it, it would be an easy thing to do to start being a bit more like this, but as I say, it's based on practice. So what I've done now is I've split this bit out into three themes. So the first one, in March 2017, a BA walked over to me uh, and my heart sank. And it's not because uh, I just like BAs or him. In fact, he was very nice and uh, you know, very competent in his job. I just knew why he would want to talk to me. We'd been on the same project for well over a year. All we were doing at that stage was changing wireframes, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and it was infuriating. We were often changing them. You know, I'd, I'd keep versions that were old because I'd often have to just go back to them. We were sort of in long lulls between doing user research because our users were quite hard to get hold of. And it was just, it was just an infuriating time. And I was just constantly reacting with emotion. My one-to-ones at this time were me apoplectic, staring at the ceiling, wondering what the hell I was doing with my life, let alone my career. And the point I think now looking back on it is that the, the diagnosis I've got is that that was all in my head. We don't control many of the things we pursue in life, yet we become angry, sad, hurt, scared, or jealous when we don't get them. And those emotions, they're about the only things that we do control. So it's about responding with reflection as a stoic versus reacting. I don't know if anyone's heard of the book, The Chimp Paradox. The idea being that we've evolved keeping a key part of our chimp brain that screams and shouts when anything happens and just is completely about reacting with emotion. It's a good book. But 
that's what I was doing. I was just reacting all the time and I was part of the problem and not the solution. And what I should have been doing was trying to find some happiness and value in what I was doing or from somewhere in work and looking for greater meaning. The second one, so in, it was slightly earlier, in August 2016, I was actually doing some research uh, in China, in Shanghai, fantastic night out, but we needed to talk to exporters and China is one of the biggest exporters in the world, obviously. The problem that we had is that we don't speak the same languages, which might sound a little bit obvious, but the problem with the site that they were using was only in English, so that they responded saying, yeah, we can speak English, it's no, it's no problem. And there was culturally a lot of value in doing that. What ended up happening was that we were turning up late to almost every session except one because they had basically learned on the UI where things were rather than what they're actually saying. Uh, and also, culturally, again, we were thinking we were turning up to one to one sessions had been sort of quite clear about that in the recruitment, but then whole departments were turning up. Then if anyone's been running a one to one session and eight people have turned up, it's, it's quite the pivot. And this one is about what can go wrong might. So there's the understanding and exploration of culture and understanding how people are different. But we will come undone when exploring and trying to find answers, which we have to accept when we're trying to seek the truth. So we need to be open to ourselves in two ways. So not be so insular around what we think or what we know. So not be so ethnocentric and make mistakes to get close to the truth. So those were the two real areas that we, we had in that work uh, was that, that the planning wasn't quite right and, and our appreciation of the culture wasn't quite right as well. But failure is the steps we climb. So, so this one is called, uh, it's got a Latin name, I'm not going to try it. It's the premeditation of evils. So it's about musing on the worst case scenario in order to calm and focus to be prepared to act in the proper way and not react. So if we'd had a better appreciation that eight people were going to turn up, then there wouldn't have been the blind panic and all the swearing. We might have just pivoted and got on with it. Epictetus, he actually imagined losing a loved one every time he kissed them, which feels like it's taken it a little bit too far. It, it feels like it kind of ruined the moment a little bit. And it is difficult to do all the time. But if we can open our minds up to change for the better, um, then great. If we don't, then we're accepting our current position and we're closing our mind off to change, exacerbating the problem and closing ourselves off to the truth, ultimately, which is what we're after. My third one is, uh, so I'll just start with just absolutism, is the holding of absolute principles in political, philosophical or theological matters. And we should really include UX in this. So a couple of years ago, I was in a pitch team where several things went wrong, uh, mostly down to me. We were demoing some designs, which is a good way of showing what we can do with their brand and articulating some of our UX thinking. It was difficult because the chemistry wasn't quite right. Um, and yeah, the, the questions didn't seem that, that straightforward, but one of them was, what do you think of these carousels? So I was yeah, great opportunity, I'm gonna jump in here. Um, so I was just like, no, we don't use carousels. It demonstrates a lack of priority in the business. No one looks past the first one, no chance. After the meeting, we had a bit of a debrief in the pub and uh, the designer pointed out to me very delicately, I thought, that uh, we actually had carousels in the designs that we were demoing. So there's quite a few things I was doing wrong there, uh, but I was one of them indulging in the very easy to attempting form of absolutism. And you hear this all the time, like lorem ipsum should never be used. The only important thing in UI is content. And the fact is that although it's an old trope, it does depend. So you can make a case for lorem ipsum if you're doing something very conceptual, the organization is very much used to lorem ipsum, they understand it, they won't focus on the words. I don't think it's anything to be particularly ashamed of. And of course, content is super important on a UI, obviously. But if you wrap it up in an inaccessible way with terrible interaction patterns, then no one's going to be able to appreciate it. And carousels are useful if you're displaying visuals like we were in the pitch. Um, and you're, I don't know, if you're looking for a house and there's a, there's a carousel there with loads of photos, it can be quite good. I was too quick to offer an opinion and sort of try and demonstrate my amazing intellect. I would have been better off listening and offering some balance. I would have been better off doing that before the pitch, to be honest. But I suppose anything that results in listening to others and adapting is beneficial. We've got a loud culture and we try and be louder in return. We're taught to have an opinion about everything, which sometimes we need to have. Um, and it ties into the point around searching for the truth and being open to it. I made mistakes uh, and I, I shielded myself from the truth. 
uh, let's be pet, absolutism is one of my pet hates because it's so unnecessary anyway debates are fine right you take a position and you defend it but the idea is that you adjust your viewpoint as a result you don't just dig your heels in further so to bring this all together a little bit my hope is that everyone can become a little bit more stoic it's a bit of an introductory talk from that point of view if it got anyone out of a hole then like it did with me then that would be amazing i think the reason i was quite keen on doing it uh, and pursuing it was that it's the talk I think I wanted to see five or ten years ago. I think it would have made a quite a big difference to my life. So what I'm going to do to make it a little bit more real is I'm going to just go through five things that I try and do every day that, that's based on stoicism. So the first one is accept what I can't change. So this is the most liberating and empowering thing that you can do, I think, for your mind. Because I'm not perfect at it, but it's the first thing I go to when anything happens. It's... Uh, it's liberating uh, mainly because you can't change the past. Uh, and if you could, it sounds really obvious, but if, if you can really accept that, that, I mean, how many times do you sort of fret about things that have happened uh, that you can't actually, you can't, you can't go back and change them. So it's quite liberating from that point of view. It's about trying to accept the misfortune. Some Stoics take it really far and they're about not only accepting the misfortune, but actively embracing it. There's a book by Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle is the Way. The idea being that the path and the things that are going wrong, that's the way for you in order to learn and grow. But I think there's a limit to it. I mean, you know, if you were to suffer a bereavement, for example, I don't think the first thing you should be thinking is, wonder what I can learn from this. Uh, so, but, but then if you, if you think about the sheer amount of day-to-day -day, uh, little things that aren't important at all, then actually it could make quite a difference. The second one is to reduce wants. So the ideal world doesn't exist. Life is messy. Design is messy. If you sit around waiting for the perfect environment to get going, you're not going to get going. A very real example that I, I fall into is uh, I sometimes wish I had a better car. But the, the thing is, I don't need a new car. It's fine as it is. And the danger is that if you're thinking about getting a new car, then you get the new car. You're thinking about your next one. And then if you apply that to everything, your TV, your sofa, your girlfriend that you're never going to enjoy what you've actually got because you're always thinking about moving on to the next thing so i think it's quite powerful from that point of view the third one is to get a little better every day so again this sounds extremely obvious very powerful in a work context though if you think about what you're missing or gaps on your cv or skills and tools and techniques that you haven't got if you think about that from an organizational point of view what you know what's the organization missing if you took something on and you chipped away at it for three months, just a little bit every day, three months, let's face it, will absolutely fly by. And before you know it, you've got something of real value that you can add. The fourth one, I touched on this with my theme. So what can go wrong might. Again, a really good example of this is my car. It went for its MOT and service a couple of weeks ago, and I had it in my head for no good reason, really, that it would cost about £1,000 to fix. I had nothing to base that on, but I was kind of thinking about the worst case scenario. And it came back, got the inevitable phone call, and it was 981. So I should have been chuffed, right? Because I'd actually saved 19 pounds. Of course I didn't, I, you know, I hit the roof. Uh, but I think it did actually take the sting out of the, the, it did take the sting out of it a little bit, because at least I got kind of thought about it and I was like, well, I did kind of expect something and uh, I knew I had to sort of go about paying for it. And the last one is practice silence. So I don't really want to be, you know, this approaching middle-aged white man wading in, talking over people's knowledge of my opinion. Because uh, if, I'm, if I'm talking, then I'm not listening. And if I'm not listening, then I'm not learning. I think this is a really key leadership trait as well, is actually being, is actually knowing when to speak up and when not, and when to let other people have their say. And so how, how do I actually do all of the above? So day to day, how do I, uh, how do I keep in touch with all of these different things? So the, one of the big things in stoicism is, is journaling um, and reflecting on what's happened. I found that the, the, the journal worked really well for me because I was already doing it, uh, but just without the framework. I wasn't putting it into these sorts of contexts. So that's, that's one real way. And I think it's really powerful to do that if you've got a problem to really break it down 
and think about it along these lines. So the different elements of it, you know, what can I change? What can't I change? I think it's, it's really powerful to do that. Right now, there's a, an awful lot going on, uh, in case you didn't notice. I'd argue that there's always a lot going on. I think if there wasn't this, there'd be something else. And I appreciate this is a bit of a one-off. Um, but there's always something else that, you know, the media is ratcheting up some fear thing. And these older guys that I talk about, Seneca, Epictetus, Aurelius, for them, it was war and violence, right? So the life expectancy was far lower than it is now. Infant mortality was much higher. As I say about Viktor Frankl surviving Auschwitz. And I wonder what we'll think when we look back in two years' time over what's going on now. Globally and governmentally, we have little say, but locally, individually, we've got lots of say. And I realise that the amount that we've got to say will depend on people's circumstances. I recognise it's not that easy for everyone. There will be people who are in situations where it's very difficult to change things. But I think that a lot of it is largely up to us. And if you can recognise what those things are at work, at home, in any given situation, then you can focus on changing the things that really matter. And what's the opposite? You know, I could have stayed at my shipping company and uh, been really miserable every time the BA walked over to me and been angry. I can plan my next research projects and just, you know, not think about what's going to happen, think about culture or anything going wrong. I can indulge in absolutism. I can definitely do that. I can pick a side. I can fight. But where's any of that going to get me? Or I fight for something that I can change, something for my users, something for my colleagues, something for my family, something for me. In the end, I left working at the shipping company because there was nothing more I could do to change it if I stayed. So I, I, that was the decision I felt I needed to make. I found a new job. Is it perfect? Of course not. Am I perfect? Yes. No, I'm, of course I'm not perfect. But stoicism isn't like getting ripped. You don't do it and then go to the beach and show it off. It's an ongoing practice. When I came up with the title of this talk, it wasn't because I was thinking I am the stoic designer. It was far more of an aspirational thing than that. So my hope is that this might in some way help you to become a better designer, a better collaborator, have a better understanding and appreciation of the ups and downs of your organization and be able to navigate that a little bit better. And I suppose of all of the things that you see, the great things that you see in UX about tools, techniques, and ways of working, I think if you wanna be a really great designer, you've got to start at home and you've got to be designerly about yourself. And I didn't wanna sound preachy with any of this because we've seen people throughout the pandemic becoming amazing people uh, when everyone else is really struggling and it's, it's really annoying and it's not about shaming people for feeling bad. And in no way am I a picture of perfection at all, but this is something that's really affected me and changed my life. So I'm hoping that a little bit of that rubs off. My alternate takeaway, if, uh, if you don't wanna be more designly about yourself, is to think about the fact that Marcus Aurelius had 13 children with his cousin. Uh, and he also said this, Waste no more time arguing what a good person should be, be one. Thank you. Okay, Joe, thank you. So um, we've got some questions uh, in the chat. So um, if you're happy, uh, we've got um, five minutes or so for five or six minutes for questions, Joe. Great. So uh, first question is, how can we apply stoicism in our life as a designer? Um, apply stoicism in our life as a designer. So day to day, I think certainly in our role, um, in our relationship with our organization, there's a huge part to play. I think it has really wide applications for many things. It certainly has a wide application when you're when you're dealing with the frustrations that you're dealing with at work. So if you, for example, are really struggling to get hold of users or you've got people that really disagree with you um, and you're fighting battles at work. I think it's really worthwhile, to, as I said, to break that down and to think about what you can actually do about it versus what you can't. And it might help you a little bit to pick your battles. I think you. Also, you always have to make compromise when you're doing design, you know, work within constraints. That's a, that's a good thing. So I think, again, it's wise to think about um, what constraints you, you just have to accept and which ones you can try and push back against. 
Um, and I think the other thing that I, that I sort of mentioned that I think is really powerful is just the thing about getting a little bit better every day um, and accepting. I think there's, it can be a little bit of impatience when you're first starting out in your career and you're getting to that point of experience two, three, four years and you're thinking, I want the next, I mean, I want the promotion, I want the next thing. And I think it's a little bit about reducing the wants, first of all, changing what you can change and just continuing to get a little better every day. Try and find out what your gaps are and just to keep keep pushing at those. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, how do you convince someone else to adopt this mindset? Or let them feel less stressed? Good question. Uh, you do talks at UX Bristol. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I, I came across it, I think, because I was, I was thinking in a similarish way. So if I look, if I look at my journal and the, the message that my brother said, he was like, I said, I know you like to journal, so hopefully this will work for you. So I was kind of already thinking along those lines anyway. How do you convince someone? I think um, there are certainly things there's certainly um you can start to socialize it a little bit more so there is there's a twitter handle called uh, the daily stoic i think it is so you can socialize it a little bit i've done internal talks i think the one thing that i would always harp on about is uh working out what you can control versus what you can't and that's the thing that i would ask someone if they came to me with a problem is to think about that thing first of all and get thinking about that in terms of wider stoic stuff, there's plenty of things to read. Um, but yeah, I'd, you can't really go out and just convince everyone to do everything. You've got to sort of sow a seed and hope they'll pick it up themselves a little bit and then kind of, uh, you know, give them some help along the way. I guess that's kind of the point, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, um, well, how can we reduce wants? That's the next question. How can we? So how can we actually stop wanting things? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is you want to recognise that the, the fact that you want it is, is something that exists purely in your mind. Uh, it's not something that exists externally, your, your need to want something. You can think about um, the influences around you that, that might make you want something. I think the only way you're going to work at that, though, is really about reflecting on why you want something um, and thinking about whether you actually need it. and actually like I said with all of it it's about practice you can't you can't just sort of turn a switch and go right and stop wanting stuff but if you really start to reflect and practice you can get to a point where it's not as important I, you know I still want things um but you get to a point where you realize it's not as important and I think that's a really good journey to go on because as I say when you do you start to appreciate everything you have got a lot more sure. it's a difficult thing to answer that I think yeah, no, these are hard questions, but they're good. <laughs> um, another question, Joe. So um, how would you recommend people to exercise the four stoic virtues and keep it in their minds at any situations? The virtues are really interesting, I think, because, and I don't know if I can actually answer that, but the, the, the virtues are really interesting because you don't, I don't think you hear as much about them as you do about, say, the vices. And it might be down to the film Seven, uh, I don't know if anyone's done a, a very f famous film about the virtues, but you don't, I don't feel like I hear about them as often. Um, I don't know how you can get someone to think about those things more often, to be honest. As, um, how do you get someone to think about, you know, having more wisdom or um, having more prudence? It's, it's, it's difficult. I think with the theme around some of these questions appears to be how can you change other people um which i guess i'd be a little bit wary about in the sense that i think the emphasis has got to be on changing yourself um and then talking to people about that because i think changing other people is really hard and it might be something you can't do and then are you going to really stress out because you can't get your manager to have more wisdom it, it might just be out of your hands Sure, yeah. So one last question, Joe, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, why is journaling important according to Stoicism? I think it's that point about uh, reflection. 
So, so the reason that the journal split up into morning and evening reflection with the questions, um, it was something that Marcus Aurelius did a lot. He has a, this is one of the starting points is a book called Meditations, which is just a, basically a notes on uh, his reflections of, on life. It's really good because otherwise you don't stop to take the time to really think about what you're doing. And it's really easy to get into habits whereby you're not at all being stoic. And so I think it's important to continually remind yourself um, and so to stop, you, stop yourself falling into traps and habits which are ultimately going to make you unhappy. I think for some people, certainly those of a more introverted nature, potentially, and I don't want to generalise, writing might come a little bit more naturally I think for other people who they might feel that they want to talk but I think I guess it's whatever helps you to think about your own behavior think about your own thoughts uh, reflect on them and and then ultimately see if you can come up with little techniques and changes that you notice because noticing is the first thing that you can then go on to change. Joe that's it yeah 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 so um yeah it's uh, I'm make a memo to myself to start to, to you know, yeah. so, I'd, well i'd recommend this this is someone get, put this on your birthday list it's great joe so thanks very much for giving us the talk uh if, if there's a way you want people to contact you uh, put it in the chat um in the youtube chat if you like um, yeah. but yeah do check out joe um everyone and i think um thanks joe i think now we can move on to the next talk uh john is dialing in all the way from uh, Colorado in the USA. Um, and John's going to give a talk about design and business. Hey, John. Hello. <clears throat> and what time is it in Colorado, John? Uh, it's 4.45 in the morning. Oh, wow. Well, uh, appreciate you getting up early. Yeah, so John uh, is in, in the US and he's going to give a talk on design and business. All right, uh, so yes, my talk is on design integration. Um, I think it does follow on nicely from Joe's talk, just in terms of um, taking a moment to reflect on, you know, what we do as user experience designers, uh, the way that we do it, and potentially challenging the notions of uh, how we practice and deliver design simply because it's the way we've been doing it. Um, and look for opportunities to uh, get uncomfortable and find um, more innovative ways to deliver. Um, so that's the basis of my talk. I uh, just want to take a moment really quickly to thank uh, Stuart, James, and Dave, all the other speakers today, uh, and this whole event. Uh, congratulations to the 10th anniversary, and I'm very honored to be here today. So I'm John, and um, I just wanted to give you a quick moment to get to know me before I, I ramble on so you have a little bit of context. Um, this is some things about me. I've, I was born into a biracial family. I was raised in Tokyo as an American expatriate. Uh, I studied sculpture, of all things, and I joined the UX field in, about, in, in 1998. Um, these things, as I contextualize them, sort of wrapping them into um, the elevator pitch of who I am, basically put me in a lot of liminal spaces where I'm neither one thing or another, I'm, I'm sort of always on a threshold or a precipice of one perspective or another. And um, it's kind of naturally led this journey for me in 2003, where I co-founded a user experience and technology design consultancy um, and you know, aptly named Limina. Uh, we've been practicing for 16 years as, as a consulting firm and um, developing processes, artifacts, systems to sell, understand, plan, design, and implement UX projects. Uh, and as we do that, we, we think, and this is as I reflect back on Joe's talk, we think about how could we always be improving the, the efficiency and the quality of the way that we do this. Um, and this has led us to uh, a moment in 2019 where we decided to conduct this design integration study. So um, I'll try to move quickly. There's a lot to get through. Um, 
I'll give you some background on the design integration study. I'll talk about our key findings, um, some barriers that exist in our industry to best practice and um, what those best practices might be and some tactical next steps. And then hopefully some time for uh, good questions and answers. Um, so why did we start this study and why study it uh, in the first place? Essentially, um, every time my team goes in on a new project, uh, there's always a different circumstance on the ground with you know, the project at hand, the team that's there to, um, to collaborate with us and um, what they're expecting from us as a delivery team. And um, this just gives rise to the fact that when you think of user experience design and, and what we do as designers, there's no one true north. Uh, so there's lots of different ways people are attacking it. Um, we're in transition from waterfall to uh, wagile or agile or some hybrid mix of all of that. And, um, and then some of the you know two-track, tri-track design stuff that's more continuous integration. So um, lots of froth and thrash in the way we practice and um, definitions for you know, who's doing what? Um, is it a service design activity? Is it business analysis? Is it user experience analysis? Um, these things aren't really normalized in any one place. Um, and we're not really calling attention to the fact that all this sort of duplicity and um, uh, redundancy is out there. So um, we want to increase awareness of the uh, maturity of human-centered design and then also um, help provide a pathway or a ramp of some sort. Um, and we're, we're not the first. For about, you know, almost 20 years now, studies have been going on about, you know, what does it mean to be a design-led organization? Um, what you're looking at here is just some background on who participated in our study um, and how the industry broke down and also uh, qualitative studies that we conducted, interviews that we conducted on the right-hand side with 10 other companies. Um, so as our survey data came in, what we found was that 86% um, of folks are still struggling to in, you know, meaningfully integrate design and to really fully realize the operational capability of, a, of an integrated design team. Um, there is this shape of 14% uh, who we consider to be design integrated and then there was this other 15% who were design conscious and sort of taking strong moves to become integrated. Um, those, between those two camps, there were seven core traits that they shared. And largely it was that um, they're making increasing investments on, uh, in a priority for um, becoming systematic in how they integrate design. Uh, there's also a strong alignment between business design and technology functions within their organization. So it's, it's not this lopsided, um, arrangement. Um, as I mentioned, we're not the first to talk about this topic of what it means to be design integrated or design led. Uh, these reports are really great and they've been mentioned a couple times today. Um, so I recommend reading them. Uh, the gap that we're trying to fill with our uh, 2020 design integration report is not just the value, of, the business value of design, um, but how might you achieve that as an organization? Um, as a design leader within your organization, and then how do you communicate to your, your managers or invite business leaders uh, from the C-suite into the conversation? So 74% um, of those companies that were design integrated had very strong alignment between design and, and business, which was um, one of those key indicators from the data. When we launched the study, uh, we baselined it on a definition of what human-centered design is. And, and essentially, you know, if you talk about design, there's lots of different interpretations. But for us, we baseline on the fact that it's not a deliverable or a role. It's a process that companies follow to, one, understand users and their context in the marketplace, their needs and um, how to empathize with them. And then to then start building solutions that are meaningful for those users in those various scenarios. Um, and then, you know, pushing that through uh, the entire practice. Uh, when we when we ask the question, 
um, does does your rate you know rate the um, on a scale of one to ten? How do you agree with the statement that your company understands what human centered design is? Sixty nine percent said they do, although the evidence was really only in, in that fourteen percent we were mentioning earlier. So some of the that's a big delta, by the way. So like what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this uh, talk here is is how do we close that gap? Um, these are some of the key questions that we introduced in the study and that sort of shaped the way the outcomes and the key findings. Um, we're looking at what the characteristics of design integrated means. Um, are you using repeatable processes? Are you creating reusable artifacts? And um, what investments are you doing to su support that? Just taking a moment, um, you know, I think we can all agree that there are market leaders out there that are really good at doing this. Um, Google, Netflix, Uber, these guys are, they're not just like leading because they were first runners. Um, some of these guys completely came in out of the blue and disrupted marketplaces to become who they are today. Um, and they did it, you know, in dealing with unexpected competition, rising customer expectations, um, new digital technologies, but you never really see them falling behind ever. They're always sort of in, um, in front. And um, part of the way they're doing this is not just that they've aligned themselves with IT and technical services uh, to support their business operations. They've actually done it a full sort of uh, level of integration where design plays equal alignment with business as well as um, technology. Um, so they're all sort of sharing their concerns for efficiency and quality in how they're delivering services and products to the marketplace. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the traits of these design integrated businesses. So within their organizations, there's a shared culture. Uh, and by this, their vision, their values, their goals, their purpose and language are shared, not just in siloed ways, but that they have like a value system that is meaningful to all the departments within their organizations. They uh, deliver this through cross-functional teams. They have shared methodologies, systems, and, and budgets to support this. And then um, they're very serious about how they're measuring this, not just um, in the marketplace and how their services and, and uh, products are performing against KPIs, but also um, as a team, how are they doing this? Um, and continuously looking at the bottom line against how they're delivering. Um, and all of these things together builds this sense of shared destiny. Um, some key points to illustrate this with Google and how they're, they're um, shaping out. I don't know if people know much about this one, but Google was named like uh, a design company of the year in 2018. And when we think of Google, we think of them largely as a technology company. But if you start to look at, you know, how are they actually building culture within the organization, you start to realize very quickly they are a design company. Um, some of these things that the CEO has, has brought, you know, as a mandate, not, not so much a mandate like this is the rule of law, but this is what we need to be doing as a part of this organization is to build a notion that they're doing something simple for users that's accessible to everyone and that, um, by having a focus on the user, they're not trying to call attention to the products and the solutions they're, they're bringing to the market, but how meaningful those products and services are to the users who need them. And this sort of um, is all driven through their organization systematically. They're, they have lots of discussions about how to, they understand the user, um, what are the design principles we can push into different parts of our products, and how will we measure and know that we're successful when, when, when it's done. Um, when you look at a lot of the other businesses out there that don't fall into this leadership category, um, some, some of this starts to look more like the, the reality. So we have strong alignment between IT and business functions. Um, largely the IT department has built up a lot of business process management systems to build efficiencies for the business itself to function. Um, Design is somewhat collaborating with engineering. Um, we're starting to see, you know, shared uh, repositories and GitHubs and um, design systems and design tokens sort of being folded into engineering 
Um, so that alignment is starting to come closer, but there really is this gap and delta between how designers and businesses communicate. Um, one of the questions we had in our survey was um, what common KPIs yield in terms of benefits to the design team. And um, the response that was heavily um, came back was that they designers have a seat at the table, right, for strategic decision making. And um, just in the follow-up anecdotals interviews that we had, um, even though they're, they're empowered with this um, sort of token seat at the table, there's still this real operational and organizational struggle that's there. So how do you really implement design integration? Is there really budget to build systems to deeply integrate design practice? Um, are we having effective communication with our C-level? Uh, do they understand the need for the, the things that we do as practitioners? Um, there's often confusion in how, where designers end up in the organization. Are they in product? Are they in marketing? Are they in sales? Um, and um, this sort of lack of common language is a problem. So all of these things sort of surround us as uh, we're, we're encouraging this sort of operational excellence. Um, at those organizations I was mentioning earlier, what we did see and how we shook out these uh, core traits were that Human-centered design is definitely a part of their culture, their DNA, um, and this is supported by the C-level C-level executives. They embrace design culture and they propagate it throughout the organization. Um, that they accept design as a shared process, not as a siloed function. Um, they work to build shared language, uh, common terminology, and taxonomies that build shared understanding. And um, they use business metrics to uh, share and track and demonstrate the, the business value of design. And artifacts and processes are created for reuse uh, and waste reduction. And then uh, finally, investments are definitely being made to codify those artifacts and processes into systems. Uh, this is just one final data slide that um, when we saw how these design integrated firms were sort of um, what, the, what did they look like? They were smaller in size. The design conscious ones, they were larger. Uh, they definitely had the revenues to invest. Uh, they're just slower to organize because there's a lot of uh, legacy there. So um, what are some of the things they can start doing? And these are the best practices. So start with embedding a human-centered design culture, uh, definitely work hard on the relationships with the C-suite to get them to understand and onboard into what human-centered design can do as a business innovation framework. Um, and then communicate for the common good of the business, build that shared language, integrate design resources into relevant business functions, capture specific met metrics and manage them, create reusable artifacts and repeatable processes to underpin this, and then ensure that there's budget and investment in uh, building systems to support this. The next uh, several slides are just um, more data and anecdotal information that support those points. So I'll move quickly through them because I, I've introduced them. But as you build a, a um, human-centered design culture, start by define, defining your organization's shared vision, values, and purpose, and then develop a change management program that can shift the concept of design as, um, as a process rather than a siloed function. Uh, and that's a cross-functional uniform across the organization process. And then build together uh, and foster collaboration among diverse disciplines. So really get deeply um, ingrained in, in a cross-functional modality. And then operate with design, business, and technology playing equal and integral roles. Uh, in crafting new strategies for, for the business. Um, common language is really one of those things. It's like a gotcha thing. It hides sort of in the background of, of everything we do, um, where we all say things and we think everyone's understanding what we're talking about. Um, it's really common that you'll say design and someone else will hear design and two different concepts are, are being shared. So it's about getting very specific about what you mean 
um, and then making sure that you've uh, eliminated the, the risk of misunderstanding. And then once you have that common language and that framework for how do you, how do you attack and, and, and talk about human-centered design as an organization, to make sure that that's sort of driven down from, from the C-suite throughout the rest of the organization. It's helpful um, that you don't think of this in a fire and forget way. I think people look at design thinking exercises and they say, this is great. This is bringing together all different parts of our organization, but they execute and then um, it's over, it kind of fizzles out. So it's about keeping that campaign of um, common language and uh, building understanding as a sort of a constant thing that's I think back to uh, the presentation where the, the map was put in the hallway in front of everyone. It's almost like doing the same thing to keep it top of mind and make sure that everyone's sort of always on the same page there. Uh, when we looked at the distribution of design-oriented folks at organizations, um, there was a real sort of breakdown of um, a third, a third, a third in terms of we're design centralized or we're design distributed um, and this other class of design um, integrated. But if you look at the departments, uh, the departmental breakdown, it's, it's really is kind of all over the place. So again, no one true north here, but um, what we found is that it's helpful if you start as a design centralized team to build that standard of practice uh, and discipline-based operational excellence. So how are we doing this as designers and how can we do it repeatedly? And, um, and then to get design distributed figure out what are the different various needs from um, the rest of the organization? How can we specialize our services to deliver throughout? And then once you have that framework down to build this design integrated practice where you're, you're both operating centralized and then you're distributing your services throughout. Um, metrics were really huge. Um, a lot of, the 87% of the folks who responded to our survey did say that they start off their design initiatives with, with conversations about metrics. Um, but it, when we looked at it, it was really the 81% of those design integrated firms that are, um, that see common KPIs yielding the benefits of the business alignment. So um, what, it, what it really meant to us was that there was a lot of interest in, in metrics and what they meant but there wasn't a lot of traceability and follow through on how do we actually meaningfully look at the design patterns we're creating to support or um, influence those metrics. And then how are we gonna measure that and know that we've succeeded? So the guidance here is to determine what those metrics are that matter, uh, what activities and touch points experiences influence those, and then what models can we test to improve those? And then, um, don't just put those out in the wild and hope that it happens. Really track the results. Um, do it in micro uh, experiments so that you're actually testing one thing that you know uh, you're going to get a result on. I think people tend to do these redesigns or these uh, functional, functional enhancements, and there's so many things packed into it that they actually don't know where the failure points are. So um, Netflix is really great at this. They, they'll release something very um, small, and then they'll, they'll see the effect of that and then make a change. So um, by quantifying those, that ROI, not on just on the product side, but what did it actually take us from the moment we understood something about the user's needs to the, to the moment we put it out in the wild, what was the full expense? How did we do that? Is it scalable? Is it reusable? How, efficient, how much efficiency gain did we have? So there's lots of opportunity for you to have business-oriented discussions as designers. Um, so this is the last point, and this is about reusability and repeatability. Um, we tend to do a lot of whiteboarding, a lot of sticky notes, um, a lot of things that we do end up in Google Docs or Sheets, um, and all these things may work their way into Jira or something that might have an API or, or some level of um, integration capability, but really a lot of the things we do as designers tend to be ad hoc, um, we, we will occasionally reference some standards or partially have something documented. Um, and the tools that we do use tend to have things siloed within their, their uh, frameworks. So um, the opportunity here is to look at, um, doesn't matter actually if you're in a waterfall mode or agile or tri-track or continuous integration, 
really look at the process that you're executing and what are the artifacts that you have that support that process? Who are the, the people who need those artifacts and at what touch points do they need them? Um, and then orchestrate uh, a artifact library that sets them up in contextually meaningful ways, provides the surrounding language for this is how you use this document, when and why. Um, make sure that repository is open, uh, reusable, but also in some way managed and governed uh, against some standards. And then um, ultimately, uh, when you're deploying in whatever you have there, G Jira, Figma, whatever, um, that you have repositories that are connected. So if there is an API, leverage it, look for the best way possible to um, integrate your understanding of the, the users, their needs, the market needs, and the business goals, and put them all into a centralized place. This last slide here looks at um, spending, really, where have people been investing in the software development lifecycle? Uh, there's, if, you know, in broad strokes, requirements, design, implementation, testing, deployment, and maintenance. And what we found was a heavy investment in deployment and definitely in requirements gathering. Uh, there was a shocking sort of deficit in design, um, though, you know, it's 70% it, uh, is, isn't a terrible number, but we do see that like in there's DevOps um, tool tooling and, and um, you know, investment in, in that area of business and how it continuously integrates uh, and deploys. But then, you know, how are they supporting the designers to execute? Um, just seems like it merits more. So when we looked at all of the respondents um, and where they're investing, um, overall, this was the rank. So process activities and activities and requirements, and then artifacts, processes and tools and design, and then artifact libraries and, and requirements. Uh, for the design conscious folks, these are the guys that are investing heavily but are not yet integrated. They're investing more in artifact libraries and tooling for design, and then uh, later on processes and activities for design. And then those design integrated folks, they, they prioritized uh, design over everything. Um, <clears throat> so I'm wrapping up, but basically what I'm saying is as designers, we spend a lot of time solving business problems and designing patterns and tools and systems for other people's businesses to succeed, their products to succeed, and their digital services to succeed. Um, and where we tend to fail to look is at ourselves, um, going back to stoicism, how can we reflect on what we do as practitioners um, and how can we do it better? There is a huge opportunity for us as designers to really think critically about systems we need to support the work we do from the moment we start understanding the marketplace and the user's needs in that marketplace to defining what that means from a requirement standpoint and prioritizing those against you know, business needs, the human, uh, so the, the user needs and, and technical complexity and all the things we do to weight our priority to actually how those tie into the KPIs and the, and the design patterns we're gonna push out. Um, there's no one system really that we have to, to help with those conversations. And we, we do it all through spreadsheets and Google Docs. Um, so um, really the opportunity is to really systematically integrate business design and technology operations um, to build repeatable, standardized and sustainable uh, delivery processes and um, really focus on creating visionary experiences. Um, there's a lot there and some of these uh, best practices fall into more strategic transformational and long-term things. I think it takes a while to change a company's culture. So um, those things you see on the right, um, think, think strategic and long-term. But tactically and upfront, um, it, it doesn't take much to start identifying which metrics cross-functional teams can manage and share um, to really look at opportunities to establish those re reusable artifacts, uh, the repeatable processes that are in, um, can build efficiency and quality in how you deliver. And then um, identify that common language and promote culture of, of human-centered design. So um, love to hear from you all now.
Great, John. Thank you ever so much for that. That's fantastic. Um, I should also point out that um, John signed into our Zoom meeting at what was his two o'clock in the morning and has been here for three hours. So he's done fantastically well to keep going. And hopefully he's uh, he's still going to be awake enough to take, uh, I think we've got time for one or two questions. Um, we've, had, we've had a few come in. So I'm just going to um, cherry pick a, a couple of them. Um, one of the ones which I think is interesting is um, obviously as, as businesses need to engage more with design and embrace design as something which is a, a core activity. Um, is there some benefit for designers to learn, be learning business skills, to be able to talk the language of business more rather than just be experts in their field? Uh, definitely. We, so what, one of the slides, I, 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 I've had some notes on it, but I kind of was trying to keep in time here, so uh, breeze by it. But the, the discussion about metrics and what it means, uh, what is the business value design, is that's a two-way street. So yes, it's important for designers to understand the language of business. Uh, what are the things that um, that are built if effective business processes, but then also for um, for business owners to really understand what are the the human centered activities that happen that support business KPIs, um, and and that's what I mean when I say build a common language or that that um, anything that might build bridges and eliminate misunderstandings between uh, departmental functions. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do see the, the, I don't know, it's like on Twitter, you'll see lots of designers saying, hey, designers need to understand business and business owners saying designers need, need to understand. But, um, it, it is a two-way street. You gotta come together on a bridge. You can't, you can't just put the onus on one person and say, that's your job. Cool, brilliant. Um, and one other question, we've, we've had this in sort of various formats actually, which is around kind of, yeah, well, one thing is I suppose you've only got 14% of companies who are design integrated, which is kind of low, <laughs> which gives us all hope in terms of our jobs that, you know, as more companies uh, sort of embrace this, and then that's a good thing, obviously. Um, but how in terms of persuasion i mean what do you do if people are skeptical and firm on their view of designers sort of execution rather than problem solving and you know how do you persuade persuade c level you know senior staff that this is the way to go i think this does go hand in glove with the the question you had a moment ago about designers understanding uh the language of business um things that are important to business managers and um, owners of product and service, digital product and service companies um, really do track back to the KPIs. So how is the, how's the product or service performing in the marketplace? Where, where's, um, where are we having tr tr issues with traction or um, user attrition or all those things. So as a designer, you start, if you pay attention to, um, and if you ally, ally yourself with business analysts and say, where is the company struggling? What, what are the problems that exist at any part of the journey from onboarding a user through supporting their excellence as a user um, and finding the opportunity to design a solution there? You become a partner of sorts. Um, I think leadership and, and um, you know, taking a tact of, of partnering rather than um, trying to convince that design is important uh, is a better way to look at it. And if you think of design as a, as a business tool or an, a tool of innovation and business growth, then you stop, you stop having the challenge of, well, design's important because, you know, it's not about the color palettes anymore. It's about how are you actually designing a solution that's meaningful for users who are going to buy or pay for your services or products. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I think we're out of time now, but there are a few more questions in the in the live chat. So I don't know, if, John, if you fancy diving in there and having a, a, a chat, that would, that would be fine. That will keep going after the live stream has actually stopped broadcasting. Um, but other than that, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'd like to bring in um, Dave and James again now just to, to wrap up. Great, so um, uh, can we get the slides up, Kirsty, too? Yep. Yeah. 
So it, it just falls to me to say thanks for, to everyone for coming. It's obviously not just uh, myself, Dave and James and Stu. It's not just us that put this on. This is put on by the Bristol Usability Group, CIC, which has grown out of the community in Bristol about sharing knowledge and also time as well, people putting time in to make these things happen. But really, it absolutely could not happen without uh, thanking our, our great speakers who have been on the stream today and also doing the workshops uh, on Thursday and Wednesday. Thanks to all of you for coming and turning up and, and listening. Thanks to our amazing sponsors, Mason Mentor, Ovo Energy and AdLib. We really couldn't have done this without you. And, and big, big thanks to Dan and Ajara, our trusty volunteers. And of course, to Kirsty and Rich, who, who um, are in the background. They work for a company called Event Amplifier. And uh, yeah, I would absolutely wholeheartedly recommend them if you want to uh, do anything like this. So that's been UX Bristol. See you in 2021.